Howdy and good evening, y'all. Tonight, for a uh, thank you for joining us tonight here at West Coast Dogman Project. I'm your host, Shane Michael Crisp, with my special guest and good friend, Mr. Roy Stubblefield. Roy, I really want to thank you for taking time out of your day to do this. It's truly an honor to have you on as your encounter is a top five in my book. It was uh, awesome talking to you the other night on the phone. <laughs> you know, I think what we talked like, what, four hours? Yeah, it was about four hours. About yeah, four about hours. four hours. Though. That's what I thought. And I was like, man, but we talked about everything other than just cryptids. I mean, we talked a little bit about your encounter, but I think I got to know more about you just like on a personal level, you know? I'm just a normal everyday guy. I'm not a good guy. I'm not a bad guy. I'm just a guy. <laughs> well, hey, you're That's a good guy, my book, brother. <laughs> I appreciate that. That just um I want to thank you for having me on. Um I hopefully um I can um add something rather than take away from your group and um you have you have a lot of courage to go out there and do what you're doing. And I commend you for that because I'm not going out in the woods looking for anything. <laughs> I'm not going to look for anything other than uh, some mushrooms, some blueberries, or I don't know, maybe a stick. But other than that, I'm not going out in the woods saying it's just, <laughs> I know what's out there. Yeah. And, and even though I've seen, even though I've seen what I've seen in the city um, with, uh, David from Texas and Paul Chafin and all of these other people that share these amazing photos and videos, Kirk Stokes. Um, I'm good. I'll, I'll continue to let you young guys do that stuff. And I'll just sit back and pray and make sure, you know, hope you guys make it back safe. Well, we appreciate that. We need it. We definitely do, especially with the dogmen and Sasquatch and getting closer and closer into the city, you know, and that, I, I've been talking to a few people and they say the veil's thinning and you know what technically that means. I just, I think there's more and more sightings that just people are now starting to come out and talk about it. I guess is 10 years ago, you're considered crazy, you know, or, but we have these awesome pages all across Facebook and, you know, these documentaries and people like Jody cook over at North American Dogman project and his dr regional directors who help people out and everything. And then, you know, we've got Kentucky Dogman project. We've got, you know, David from Texas with his awesome show, bringing in guests and Carlito Castro. And, you know, there's just so many pages out there that are, I, I think, helping people out that are having them come on their shows on YouTube and whatnot. And I really, I, I'm barely cracking in, you know, I just, I'm an enthusiast of these cryptids and myself, but, you know, I mainly hone in on just the one, what we call dogman, you know? So, but, you know, I, uh, so that, about that though, I mean, we didn't just talk about your encounter. You want to tell us a little about yourself, uh, for the people that haven't heard your encounter, Roy? You there? Oh, technical difficulties, you guys. Sorry about that. We interrupt. Bear with us real quick. Oh, looks like he's back. Let's see. Okay. I'm back. Good. I don't know what happened. And I'm here, <laughs> yeah. Probably hit the exit button. <laughs> oh, because I was sitting here with my hands folded, so I'm like, okay, what's going on here? But um, <laughs> I can't remember where we left off, so um, oh, uh, I don't know what we were talking about. But, uh, on the phone, and uh, we talked a little bit, not just about your encounter, but, you know, everything else but I, what i was going to get at was did you want to tell us about you roy i mean other than the people for the people that haven't heard your encounter sure i can do that um my name is roy stubblefield um i just turned 58 last month thank goodness he gave Happy me another year. thank you um 
got a wonderful grandson, four kids. Um, they're awesome for the most part, but sometimes I like to uh, take them in and get their trade-in values checked, of course. But for the most part, I'm happy with them. Um, just an ordinary, everyday guy. I mean, I live my life um, the best way I know how, and I've um, stuck my foot in the cryptic pool um, a couple of years ago, and, well... For the most part, what I found out about it is it's good if you mind your P's and Q's, but as soon as you start expanding and bringing more people into that, that's when you find out who don't wash their feet and all the drama and backbiting and zealots and messiahs and all that stuff. And it's it just not for me. So uh, um, I'll expand on that uh, once we get done with the interview. But other than that, man, I'm just, you know, we talked, I like fishing and I walk around, of course, you know, I like good food like everybody else, but there's nothing really spectacular about me. I mean, other than my mind, I think my mind is what gives me a partial leg up on some yeah. people, but I'm not a genius by any means, but i got a good dose of common sense. So I'm just the average ordinary guy that I'm trying to get by still. And I thank God every day for another day and um the last two years have really opened my life not only about cryptids but the paranormal and just the different mindsets that exist but i i'm not going to go into a lot of stuff like that so i'm kind of rambling now but i'm just a, i'm just like you man i'm just <laughs> you know trying to find my happiness wherever i can and just enjoying life now that's that's about it. Nothing special. That's awesome, though, man. I mean, like you say, you think you're just an ordinary guy, but Roy, you've helped a lot of people out, and you're well, really well known in the crypto community. So, and your encounter is, you know, I've listened to it, I think, four times now, and I should have shared it on the page a few times, but I, you know, got sidestepped. But just more trying to promote, you know, the interview, what we were going to be doing tonight. But uh, uh, so I mean, before we jump into your encounter, um. I wanted to give a special shout out uh, to a few people tonight. Uh, Paul Schaefen from Kentucky Dogman Project and David from Texas who helped me start. Uh, who helped me start out as a dogman researcher? Uh, Carlito Castro over at Cryptid and Paranormal Kingdom CPK who helped me create this platform that we're doing uh, Streamyard, and to all the active members on our Facebook page who helped us get to where we are today. Couldn't thank you all enough. And to my beautiful and lovely wife Lisa and my son Perry who allow me to do this hobby as I do spend a lot of time outside of work researching these creatures. Um, okay. Before we dive into the, uh, Roy's encounter guests comments will be answered after Roy is done. Um, Roy, if you wanted to tell us about what happened, every detail, you know, what happened in 1981, I mean, the platform's yours, brother. Okay. Um, <sighs> You know, um, when all of this first happened to me, I'm just going to say this real quick. I never had an inkling that these things existed. Uh, you know, you see your werewolf movies on TV or read books about them, but that's nothing. That's nothing compared to what I saw, man. At that time, when I had my encounter, there was no Vic Cundiff to reach out to. There was no Brenton Saul when I could talk to. There was no Jeffrey Naldani, no no um, Lance Hightower, none of those guys. So I had to try to figure out exactly what I saw myself. And it took me somewhere that I never thought I would be. But... Um, I've rambled on enough about that. Um, I used to live with my cousin and his mom. And I, she didn't like us to refer to her as auntie because she felt that that made her seem old. So um, 
I would either call her Pat or um, sometime, hey, you, and be ready to duck when I said that. But um, I just graduated from high school and I was living with my cousins at the time, had been living with them for a couple of years. And his mother came home from work one day and she said, we're going to have a family meeting. Okay, usually when that happened, that means somebody didn't do something they were supposed to do. That means there's going to be a problem. So I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, and, you know, we kind of figuring, well, what, what, what do we not do? But it wasn't that it was she was informing us that she was going to be relocating to New Orleans. And at that time, I didn't question her leaving her son and going to Louisiana because I figured he was going with us. But um, she told us about this and our reaction was, wait, are you serious right now? You're going to leave an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old in a three-bedroom house by themselves and you're going to be in another state and you're not coming back no time soon? <laughs> Jackpot! Jackpot! <laughs> Let the let the parties begin. No super parental supervision. Oh, this is gonna be the best summer ever. <laughs> and shortly after we did our little high fives and stuff like that, she called me in the kitchen and said, Well, hey, can you help me drive down to Louisiana and unload the U-Haul? And uh Friday, I'll send you back home on the bus. I think of Continental Trailways. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Also at this time, I had just gotten out of my first serious relationship with my girl. So going out of town at that time for me was something that I needed because I was a little, I, well, I'm not going to say a little, I was bent out of shape about it, but it wasn't the end all to be all, if you know what I mean. I was sad, but I'm young enough, I bounced back real quick. At this time also, I had been playing football since ninth grade. And I started working out, getting my body ready for football. But with all the amount of basketball that I played, uh, playing football, I even wrestled for a short time in high school. I was in shape. I could bench 350 pounds. And I could squat 500 pounds. I'm sorry, I benched 300. I'm sorry, I benched 300 pounds. Now, a lot of people think that you pick up 300 pounds, and that's what you're working out the entire time you're working out. No. So let me clear this up right now. And when you bench press something for football, it's off your chest, up once, and then back down. That means you bench press 300 pounds. What I worked out with was between 200 and 225 pounds. And with the squat, it was the same thing. Put it on your shoulders, go down once, come back up. Okay, you can lift 500 pounds, get this damn thing off of you. But I was in shape, and I also ran a 4.340 yard dash. Wow. So when it came time to get out of town, I get out of town. <laughs> I, well, I get out of town, and I'm gone. I played tailback and free safety. Wow. NFL stats um, I, right there. I always right. wanted – well, I always wanted to not only be the one taking some punishment, I wanted to be able to leave a little, you know, leave a little bit of that on the field too. So if you come across the middle in my zone, quarterback better not throw the ball up high. <laughs> or <laughs> I own you, Mr. Paper Man. I own you. So, Your head on. Um, so, you know – well, playing both ways, it really kept, you know, kept me in shape. Yeah. And my stamina was a little bit better than just a person that played offense in the game as opposed to a person that plays defense through, mm -hmm. just the defensive position through the game. But um, after she told me or asked me to help her drive, I told her, sure, I'll do that. Went in there and told my cousin what was going on. He like, well, how long are you going to be gone? I said, I should be back Friday, man. This was a Saturday we had the meeting and – we started loading the truck that night and finished Sunday, and we left Monday morning. Arrived in Louisiana Tuesday, a little bit afternoon. 
pulled up to the apartment and because of the drive, she just said, let's just take the beds out and we'll unload everything else tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So we took the beds out, went and got something to eat and we actually went to Popeye's Chicken. That was the first time I had Popeye's Chicken. And I'm here to tell you right now, you want to talk about heaven on a fork? <laughs> Back then, Popeye's was heaven on a fork. I've never had some chicken that was that good and fresh baked biscuits. Oh, my God. I'm like, if I keep eating here, I ain't going to be ready to play any kind of football. But <laughs> right. <laughs> we went back. We finished playing. Uh, I'm sorry. We finished unloading the, the U-Haul and got everything into place. And um, she asked me, she said, well, you want me to show you around the city since you're here? I said, yeah, that'd be good. You know, let me see what New Orleans got, you know, what it's like. And so she took me to a few tourist attractions. And then that night, we went down there to the French Quarter. And I'm look, walking down the street and looking at these people walking down the street, drinking alcohol in public. You got some dudes standing on the corner, whether they playing a guitar, a banjo, saxophone. You know, one guy, he was doing a little scat dance while this guy was playing harmonica. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. And you got all of these clubs, whatever genre of music you like, you can find them on in the quarters. You know, whatever you like, jazz, blues, uh, rock and roll, country. Um, not so much hip hop at that time, but a lot of R&B. I actually got to see the Neville Brothers perform when I was down at two. And... I'm looking at this, but I'm looking at these people drinking these big old 32-ounce cups, man, of alcohol, and I'm like, the hell they got in the cups? And I see some police officers, but nobody, no cop is stopping anybody. You know, you got to pour that out. You know, I'm from Nebraska, Omaha. You walk down the street with a beer back then, they're going to pull up on the curb in front of you like, hey, either you pour that out or I'm going to give you a ticket. <laughs> Ain't no public drinking there. Not in 1981. Absolutely not. So, I was amazed, and I'm like, well, hell. And then with the food, you add that in, and so as I'm talking to Pat, I'm like, I don't want to go back to Omaha. I want to stay here. And she looked at me, and she said, why? I'm like, look, Pat, the Omaha don't have this stuff. Look at all of this stuff. She's like, are you sure you just saying that? I'm like, no, I want to see what else New Orleans got to offer. It's a big city. Omaha is not. I want to see what it has to offer. Can I stay? She's like, well, I thought she was going to go to school this fall. I'm like, they got colleges down here. I can go to school down here. She's like, well, you know, you're going to have to get a job, too, to help with the bills. I said, I can do both of those. Can I stay? And she said, are you sure? I'm like, I'm positive. So we made an agreement. You get your job. Come um, school time, you're going to be enrolled in school. I'm like, I can do that. No problem. So I was officially staying in New Orleans. Uh, we went back to the apartment, and I started looking for a job the next day. It took me eight days to get a job, and I got a job at a place called Chess King. It was a men's clothing store. Now, this store sold mostly men's clothes, but it was the type of clothes that they sold. If you wanted to look like Michael Jackson with the red and black jacket, you go to Chess King. If you wanted to look like the guy that was the lead singer for a flock of seagulls, Duran Duran, um, Earth went in fire, you went to Chess King to get these clothes. You really couldn't find them anywhere else, but we had a small women's section also. And that was a bonus for me because not only all these guys come to the store, but Occasionally, you got a female coming in. So I put in the application. I got interviewed that day, and I guess I impressed uh, my boss enough where she gave me the job on the spot. And she told me, well, when can you start? I'm like, I'm here now. She's like, well, no, you can't start right, right here today. I wish you could, but I could start you tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So that's how I got a job at Chess King. Um, I liked it. I'm a people person. I can talk to people. And if you listen to me long enough, I can send you some swamp land in Arizona <laughs> if you listen to me long enough. So I think I'm a pretty good salesman. So I think you um, are too. <laughs> I guess I, <laughs> I guess I had been there. Well, I don't guess I had been there approximately a little bit longer than two weeks because 
I was either catching the bus to work or Pat would drop me off and I catch the bus home. But on my bus rides, I seen this Monte Carlo. And a couple of times I got off the bus and actually went and looked at it. But of course, I didn't have money for a down payment. And it was a 1978. It was the color of a new penny with a half white top. That car was, I fell in love with it when I seen it. And I said, I got to have this car. So I saved my checks and I took that guy $475. And I talked to him for two hours. And he was telling me, well, I know you're not going to get this car and take it and go back to Nebraska. I said, first of all, I'm about to give you almost all the money I got. I don't even have enough money to put gas in it to get all the way to Nebraska. So I'm not going anywhere. I said, but you can come to my job and see that where I work at. You know, you didn't have, it was different back then when you're purchasing the car, especially by your pay here. They didn't run no credit checks and all that kind of stuff like that. You know, a handshake and your word pretty much got you into a vehicle. So um, we talked for a couple hours, and when I left that day, I left in that car. Good. I got so many compliments the first two days, and I'm just like, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I know I like it, too. It had the fresh uh, velour seats in it, and, you know, the air worked, and everything was just, life was changing for me to a certain extent. You know, this is my second vehicle I got, and the first car I had, I'm lucky if I get three blocks away before the battery died because the alternator was bad and I didn't know nothing about cars. So this was really a comma for me. But after I got the car on a Wednesday, I was at work. It was in the AM. My boss was helping uh, a couple of customers and I was standing at the counter in between rotating old stock because we had a shipment coming in. So I was rotating the old stock to the front and put in the new stuff in the back. You know how they do. You will still want to get your old stuff out, but you want to make sure they're displaying the clothes so that they see the new stuff. And above the door, there's a little bell to let you know when somebody come in or go out. And I heard the bell chime. So I turned around and looked and Shane, the woman that I seen standing there, she had everything that Uncle John needed. Eyes, breasts, hips, thighs, and I'm looking at her like, holy jumped up bald head, Jesus Salamina, <laughs> you know, <laughs> look at this, you know, look at her. <laughs> and of course, I'm single now, and I'm young. I haven't um, engaged in the shaking the sheets, if you know what I mean, in quite some time, so she's looking real good to me. <laughs> but I'm trying to think about should I say something to her or should I just do my job and treat her like a customer? Because even though um, sexual harassment wasn't a big thing back then, it still was a thing. And I didn't want to lose my job, especially when I'm working with the lady that hired me. So I just walked over to her and asked her, you know, hi, how are you doing this morning? You know, can I help you with something? And she said, no, I just want to browse around and I'm looking at her and, she smells good, and uh, but it was it was something about her that at that time, because of my age, I couldn't put my finger on it what it was. But now I realize what it was. It was her aura. It was it was strong. Yet because of my age, like I said, I felt something, but I just didn't know what it was because it was different, but not recognized for what it was. It was an aura. So I walked back over to the counter and I was doing a little paperwork and then I came back to finish stocking and she pulled a shirt off the rack and she asked me, she's like, do you have these in any other colors? And I'm like, yeah, we just got these in. Let me go on the back and see what other colors we have. So I did that and we had three other colors and I brought them out. Purple, orange, and white. And she selected the orange shirt and the purple one. And I said, okay, um, anything else I could help you with? And she was like, no, I think that's it. So I started, you know, well, uh, I said, hey, um, I'm new in town. Uh, you know, what's your name? And, you know, I started to flirt and stuff. And she flirted back a little bit, but it wasn't anything that would give me a definite sign that she was interested. But I talked to her for approximately 
20, 25 minutes. And then I finally was like, well, you know what? You better go ahead and shoot your shot because the other customers that the boss had been helping is gone. And she kind of standing over to the side looking at me. And I asked her, I said, hey, um, can I take you out on a date? And she looked at me. She looked me up and down and she looked me in my face for maybe 10 seconds. She just looked at me and she said, yeah, I'll go out on a date with you. Cha-ching, jackpot. <laughs> All I got to do is get the telephone number and the address now and plan on where I'm going to take her. Jackpot. So I said, well, hey, you know, we went over to the counter and I was ringing her up and I grabbed a, a, a receipt. The fact that I could write in the tour page off so I could write her number. And I said, well, why don't you give me your telephone number so I can call you and let you know what time to come get you. And she looked at me and then she glanced away and she said, uh, I can't give you my telephone. Now, I didn't look at both her hands. I'm not seeing a ring, but that doesn't always mean you're not married. So I'm like, to myself, I'm like, damn. Oh, man. I said, okay, no biggie. I said, well, give me your address. I got to know where I'm going to come and get you. Well, she looked at the floor and she said, I can't give you my address either. And that's, you know, I guess I put the expression on my face to where it's like, Man, you got a husband or a boyfriend or maybe a girlfriend. I don't know, but damn, you ain't giving me nothing. So I'm like, well, if I can't have your number or your address, you know, how I'm going to come and get you? And she looked at me and she said, no, I don't have a husband. No, I don't have no boyfriend. My mother won't let men or boys come by the house to court me. Now, not a lot of people use the word court. But I know what it means. And I just kind of raised the eyebrow when she said that. And I'm like, oh, really? So how are we supposed to meet? She said, well, there's a park a couple of blocks from my house. Let's just meet there at 7 o'clock. But I gave her my telephone number. I said, I'm going to give you my number. And if anything happens between now and Friday, just call me and let me know. I said, and here's a card for Test King. If you can't reach me at home, just call me here. And she said, okay, I'll do that. So... We talked for another five minutes and my boss is looking at me because I'm kind of, you know, every now and again, I'll look over at her and she's kind of got this little smile on her. And I walked to her to the door. And at this time of morning, the sun is actually spilling into the store through the windows and the, the, the door, you know, the front windows on the store. So when you go out, you're facing the sun. But if you turn around and say something to somebody, It'll hit your face at a certain angle. And I opened the door for her and she walked out and I said, OK, I'll see you Friday, seven o'clock at this park. And she said, all right. And she turned around. And for a split second, when I was looking at her eyes, dude, because of the way the light hit it, she had gold flecks in her pupils. And I'm sorry, in her eyes, gold flecks where her eyes were a hazel brown color. And around her, her pupil, it looked like a gold ring around her pupil. But it was so fast that I wasn't sure. But I did see the gold flecks in her iris. And I was like, man, you got some amazing eyes. And she's like, thank you. I'm like, no, you really got some amazing eyes. I've never seen eyes like that. And she kind of blushed a little bit and smiled. And um, she said, okay, well, I'm going to get ready to go and, and I'll see you Friday. You're going to be there, right? I'm like, no, the question is, are you going to be there? She said, I'll be there. So when she turned and walked down the sidewalk, being the dog that I was at the time, I, guess, I kind of leaped around the corner and watched her walk away. And I was like, mm, mm, mm. oh, <laughs> give me strength. You know, I got a date with this one. I got a date with her. So I turned around and walked back in the store and my boss looked at me. She got this smile. She's like, you pretty smooth. You know that? I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, I heard what you were saying to her. I'm like, I wasn't out of line. She was like, no. She said, but you pretty smooth. She said, you sure you 18? I'm like, yes, I'm sure. She's like, okay. She said, but um, you're going to get the rest of that stuff put away now, right? I'm like, yes, ma'am. I'm going to get on it right now. So I finished out my day. And shortly before it was time for me to get off, I asked her, I'm like, you know, did you hear the name of that park? She said to meet her. And she said, yeah, I'm like, 
where is that at? She said, that's in Metairie. I'm like, where is Metairie? And she said, that's about 20, 22, maybe 20, maybe 23 miles away. And I'm like, oh, that's not that far. I got a car. That's not that far. I'm like, how do I get there? She's like, how long you been here? I'm like, and I told her, she's like, oh, so you really don't know your way around. I'm like, no, ma'am. I pretty much know how to get to work and the grocery store and the gas station. That's all. And the French Quarter. That's all I know. So she drew me a map on how to get there. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much. She's like, all right. Um, you have a good time. I'm like, I'm not supposed to meet her till Friday. It's just Wednesday. So it seemed like it took Thursday forever to come and go. And then Friday came. And because I work in a clothing store, I never picked out an outfit at home to go out on this date. I took some stuff off the rack and used my employee discount and purchased it there and got dressed in the storeroom. And when I came out, I said, I look okay. She's like, yeah, you look okay. You're not overdressed. You look like, you know, you're going on a date, but you're not overdressed. I'm like, okay, that's what I was looking for. She said, well, you have a good time and I'm going to see you in the store uh, Monday, right? Because we were open Saturday, but I was off Saturday. She gave me that Saturday off, but we were closed on Sunday. So she said, I'm going to see you Monday, right? I'm like, yes, ma'am. I'll be here Monday. So I went and got my car, set my map up where I could see it, and I drove in, uh, up Carrollton until I hit Carrollton to Tulane, and then I went over the overpass. We put you on Airline Highway, and it's a straight shot to go from New Orleans up to Metairie. And um, she had told me when I see the uh, Win dixie sign that my turn is coming up. If I get past Win dixie I went too far and I'm about to turn around and come back. But I, I found my turn and I made the left and I drove up to the, uh, the street where the park was at and I parked. Now, this park, it has a basketball court in it. But because of how much it rains in New Orleans and Louisiana, it, the sun could be out when you go to work, and if some clouds roll in by 10, 1030, it's going to be raining by 11 o'clock, and it's not going to sprinkle. It's going to be raining hard. So a lot of the outdoor basketball courts have this roof over them that's made out of tin, and then, of course, they have lights in the park, too. On Monday through Thursday, the lights stay on till 9 o'clock. On Fridays and Saturdays, they stay on till midnight and then they don't turn on at all on Sundays and they were on an electronic timer. So I pulled up to the park approximately 650, 654, 656, right around in there. And I, I checked my watch and I got out and I looked forward when I walked up and I didn't see it, but it was some guys playing basketball and they have these three tier bleachers on one side of the park that you can sit on while you're waiting for, if you're waiting for another game or if you're just sitting in the park talking. Now, this park is not huge. If you put 100 people in it, you're going to be rubbing elbows with somebody. But 75 people at a whole fine, but it was only in the park at that time, I'm going to say I didn't do a head count, so I'm going to have to say approximately 30 people max because there were some other people up there with uh, kids playing on the playground equipment. So I went and sat down, and I hadn't been there five minutes. I checked my watch, and this guy walked up to me. And he said, hey, man, we got next. You want to play basketball with us? And I looked down at what I had on, and then I looked at him, and I looked down at myself again. I said, no, man, I'm not here to play basketball. I had on a button-up shirt, short sleeve, some dress shorts, and um, some sandals. I said, I'm not here to play basketball, man. I'm, I'm waiting on somebody. He said, oh, yeah, who is that? Now, I don't know you. You just walked up to me out of the blue, and now you want to get my personal business, and I'm like, well, when she get here, if you see her, and you know her, then you know who I'm waiting on. He's like, oh, okay, okay. He said, by the way, man, my name is Herman, and we shook hands. I said, hey, Herman, my name is Stubb. How you doing? And he said, you know, he said, where are you from? Because you got an accent. And I kind of started laughing because I'm like, I'm down south in Louisiana, and I'm from Nebraska. And you got the nerve to say that I got an accent? You are hilarious right now. <laughs> but everybody told me that, that I had an accent. And I'm just like, okay, I, I don't hear it, so whatever, man. But 
these other five guys for. They ask the same thing. Hey, man, you want to play basketball? I'm not here to play basketball, guys. I'm waiting on somebody. Oh, yeah, who's that? When she get here and you see her, if you know her, you'll know who I'm waiting on. And then they introduced themselves to me, but nobody gave me a Steve or a Levante or a Christian or a Marquise. It was Diamond and Little Bit and Shorty Mac and um, the other dude they call Caps. And I can't remember the other guy's name right off the top of my head, and I don't have my journal open. But they introduced themselves. I shook hands, and I'm, you know, we. You know, shot the breeze for maybe 10 minutes, and then it was their time to go and play. So I watched them play, and I'm looking at my watch, and I'm like, dang, it's like 7.15. Where's she at? But my mother and my grandmother told me, you know, it's a woman's prerogative to be late. So I'm like, probably she's going to be here about 7.30. 7.30 come and go. 7.45 come and go. And I started getting that feeling in my stomach. I'm like, she done stood me up. I done drove way out here, and she ain't going to pull a no-show. All right, well, I'll wait till 8 o'clock. If she ain't here by 8 o'clock, I'm going to just have to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my night. So 8 o'clock came. I got up and I started to walk through my car. And Herman seen me leaving. He's like, well, she didn't show up, huh? I'm like, nope. So he said, well, you know, you're here, man. You might as well stay and play basketball with us. I said, you know what? You're right. So since I fished, and I've been fishing since I was 12. I always kept a rod and a small tackle box in the trunk of my car. I also keep a change of clothes in there because I don't know where I'm going to find a body of water that I want to fish at if I'm just out riding and leaving home from work or I might go straight from work, but I don't want to get blood and fish slime on my good stuff. So I have a T-shirt and some shorts in the trunk of the car and my tennis shoes. So I just grabbed them out of the trunk and I went in the bathroom at the park to change clothes. And I came out, and I'm like, okay, let's play ball. So for the next four hours, I either was playing basketball with these dudes, or if we lost, I'm sitting on the bleachers with them, and we just shooting the breeze. 12 o'clock come, the lights cut off immediately, and it's pitch black in this park. It's the only light is coming from the street lights next to the park. Now, right across the street from the park, there's houses. You know, Airline Highway is about 50 feet, or maybe 60 feet from where I was sitting at. You can hear cars going up and down. And I've been drinking that hot faucet water all night. I'm like, man, I need a cold beer. And yes, when I was 18, I was able to walk into a liquor store and purchase beer because of my size. They just figured I was old enough. I never got ID. And I was okay with that. So I asked one of the fellas, I'm like, hey, uh, where's the closest liquor store, man? Um, I want to get me a cold beer. And they had been standing by the end of the bleachers, and I guess they were putting in money to get enough to get a case of beer. And they were all about my age. The whole time I was with them, I never got the feeling that they were going to rob me or kill me or beat me up or anything like that. You know, from the conversation we had, they were just everyday, ordinary guys that was trying to get by in life and, and live their life. You know, they evidently have been knowing each other since kindergarten, the first grade, maybe the third grade, but they all knew each other well enough that, you know, they was friends. You could tell they were friends. Now, When, um, I can't remember who it was, but one of the dudes said, hey, Herman, I know you got a dollar, right? And I asked him, I said, why do you call you Herman? You don't look like a Herman. And before he could answer, it was Diamond that said, because his head is big like that dude on the, the Monster Show. That's why we call him Herman. He said, look at the size of his head. And he did have a good size noggin on him. I can't lie. He did have a good size head on him, but I don't think I would compare to Herman the Monster of the Monster Show. But I got a real good laugh after that. You know, he's like, "F y'all, f y'all, man, y'all always got jokes and stuff." So I was like, "I said it's okay, man." I said, I, "You know, I'm not trying to be mean or that, but I just think that's funny as hell that they call you Herman because of that reason." But that wasn't his real name. I don't know what his real name. Because 
So they said, well, you can come and go with us to the liquor store. We, um, I guess I might should turn the light on. I'm kind of losing myself in the dark. So I said, uh, you know, it's, um, that didn't help at all. But hold on just a minute, Shane. Let me turn no the light on. It's starting to get dark here. Okay, now you can see me a little bit better. So they said, well, you could just come and go with us, man, because we're about to go to the liquor store now. I said, okay. Um, now, at this time, I made a decision that could have changed the rest of my life. It seriously would have changed the rest of my life. I just got my car. I've had it almost a month. I could have put all of the dudes in my car and drove to the liquor store. But because of my vanity, and I'm not about to put no sick, sweaty, rather smelly human beings in my Monte Carlo, and they sweat all over my seats and leave that, no, that ain't happening. I'm like, all right, I'll just walk with y'all. Now, I had a gun at the time. I bought a gun about four months before I left from Nebraska. I had a 357. I bought it from a dude on the street. The only thing he told me is, this gun ain't been used to kill anybody. That didn't necessarily mean that was the truth. You sold me this gun for $100, man. Maybe you selling it because you have killed somebody. With it. I don't know, but I knew I needed some protection for certain individuals in Nebraska because they just was out of control. But being in a, a new state and city where I really didn't know anybody, I wanted to have a gun. And so I had my gun in the trunk. I didn't feel the need to take it out of the trunk and take it with me because I just didn't get that negative vibe from any of them dudes. They seemed like decent enough dudes. So I'm like, okay. And plus with the shape I was in, if something went south, long didn't anybody have a gun, I think I would have been able to hold my own against all of them simply because I'm not scared of any man. I'm not. Whether it be Andre the Giant, Dave Batista, one thing I know is you got all that muscle mass on you. All I need to do is make you chase me for a solid three minutes. And as soon as you start huffing and puffing, I'm coming back to chop down the tree. I'm coming back to chop down the tree. I just got to get you tired enough that if you do put your hands on me, you're not going to snap my neck. But I was reasonably strong at that time, so I wasn't scared of any man. None. And I'm like, I I'll be all right. But then we just going to the liquor store, even though I don't know exactly where we're going. So initially, I figured we was going to leave and walk down the airline highway and go across the street and then go up the street to Win dixie It's a grocery store. I know they sell beer. But when we exited out the park, you come out of the park and you walk down the street, maybe 25, 30 feet. And then you cross the railroad tracks and then you can walk the rest of the 25 feet and be right there on the airline highway. Well, they turned and started walking down the railroad track. And I kind of paused for a hot second. And I'm like, why are they going this way? What liquor store are they going to? This is what I said to myself. But this is where y'all grew up. This is y'all hood. I'm going to go with y'all. I didn't get any negative feelings. Now, once you enter the railroad tracks, you walk across the street and it's level. And then as soon as you exit the street, the sides drop off from the sides of the railroad tracks to where you're elevated about three feet up in the air and to my immediately left there were three buildings a junkyard a lumber yard and a tire shop but they were connected directly behind these buildings there were three separate street lights but they were almost exactly in the middle of the buildings but they're spaced far enough apart that you can walk through one and be in the light, but between the end of that light and the beginning of the next light, it's an area of gloom where you can see a silhouette, but unless you're about five feet 
from the person you're seeing, you won't be able to tell who they are, but you can see that solid black outline of them. So I've been going through my mind trying to come up with the approximate distance that would be, and I still, I guess so much time has passed, I still can't give you definitive measurements for the distance, but it was far enough to where I had to take some steps to get from being directly in one light into the next light. So we're spaced on the tracks. I'm sorry. To the right of us, there's this field of thistles. And this field of thistles is thick. And for anybody that doesn't know what a thistle is, it is a plant that starts out like a dandelion. And then as it grows, it gets a purple flower on the top, one single purple flower, but the leaves on it got these, I call them needles, because if you ever get stuck by one, it feels like somebody stuck you with a hypodermic needle, and the leaves get rather long. Now, they grow in Nebraska, but they usually top out about five or six feet. That's it. But because of how much rain you get in Louisiana, these things were up seven and a half, eight feet. They, they were tall and they had long leaves on them, man. And I was like, they were just so thick. I'm like, did somebody plant them over there like that? You know, just throw a handful of seeds willy-nilly or what? But there were houses on the other side of this field. And this field was approximately 150 yards from the base of the tracks over to where the houses that I could see were. And... You can see that there were porch lights on the back of some of these houses, but there were certain ones you could see between the houses where you could see there was a porch light on the front. But I think I only counted five lights, and I was like, damn, that's a long field. But that's neither here nor there for me at that time because it's just a field of thistles. I'm with six other dudes. So we entered the tracks, and we're spaced out. There's three in the front, two in the middle, and me and Herman are bringing up the rear. And we're walking along and we're crunching on the rocks and stuff. And Herman, just out of the blue, said, hey, man, um, what do you uh, do when a baby is sick? I looked at him and said, you take him to the doctor. He's like, oh. He said, is there any way to tell what they got? Like, not unless you're a doctor or um your mom or your grandmother tell you, you know, if they got a cold, if they got thrush, you know, you know, whatever a baby can have. He's like, oh, okay, thanks. I said, you're welcome. And then he said, well, how often do you got to feed them? Like, when they hungry. What do you mean? <laughs> and I kind of looked at him a little bit like, why are you asking me these questions about these kids? And he said, well, when they wake up, you know, do you know how to change a diaper? I said, yeah, I mean, I had experience. I wasn't an expert at that time by any means, not like I am now, but not then. And he said, uh, and I said, Herman, why are you asking all these questions about babies, man? Because for a hot minute, I'm thinking, you know, you're some kind of pervert or something. What, what, why are you asking these questions about kids? He's like, oh, oh, man. He said, my girlfriend, she about to have our baby next week or the following week at the latest. And he said, dude. I'm scared. I'm, you know, I'm kind of scared. I'm like, what you scared of? He said, I don't know nothing about no kids. I said, Herman, take a deep breath. Relax. This is what I said. Your life is about to change for the next 18 years. I know if as I was in bus about that, but it's not going to be a bad thing, man. This is going to be a time where you learn what it's going to be like. You no longer have to worry just about yourself. Now you have to worry about another individual. So it's not a bad thing. Why are you scared? He's like, I just don't want to be a bad father, man. I, I, I just don't want to fail. And I'm like, I understand that, but you get them thoughts out your head and just replace that with, I'm going to be the best father that I can be. That's the way you think about that. He said, yeah, yeah, you're right, man. You're right. I'm like, okay, thanks. I said, so get rid of this fear you got. But I could tell he had some concerns just because of the way, you know, he was looking at me when I was talking to him. He was a little wide eyed, you know, but it was more with along the lines, I guess, of 
I don't know what's going to happen next when this baby comes. I said, well, you can always go get you some books, talk to your mother, talk to your grandmother. They got experience with kids, man. They raised you. So just talk to them. You always be willing to ask questions. The only stupid question is the one you never ask. He's like, all right, Stub, man, thanks. I appreciate you having to talk with me. So I have been looking at him and then looking forward. And I kind of looked to the right. And when I looked to the right, he said, what, did you see something? I said, no, man, it's just black back here. And I'm looking around. He's like, well, I just want to let you know that in the junkyard, there's this big black dog. He's like, I don't know if it's half Rottweiler, half Labrador, or half Rottweiler, half uh, German Shepherd. He said, but he's a big black dog. He said, but sometimes every now and again, he get out. He said, but if he get out, just pick up a handful of rocks and throw them at him and start hollering, and he probably going to run off. He'll be barking, but he'll run off. He ain't going to won't bother you. I'm like, okay, well, that's nice to know. So we had just walked, been walking up under the first light, and we were hitting that area of gloom. And I, we took maybe four more steps, maybe five, and I was turning to look to my right again over the thistles and Herman was talking to me and I seen something out of my peripheral come out of the thistles up onto the tracks but it jumped out now like I said I just seen like a black flash just like I mean right at the edge of my peripheral and something told me whether it was primordial instinct or God or Jesus or my guardian angel, run is what I felt, and that's what I started doing. And a lot of times when you whip people, if you start running, they'll start running too without looking to see what's chasing you. Some people will do that. Some people will stand there and look to see what it is, and the other dudes took off running when they heard me start running. Maybe they figured the dog was out. I don't know, but they started running. And I heard Herman taking a few steps. But like, I'm going to get out of town. I'm about to kick in all that four three, maybe four two, depending <laughs> on what's back there. But I don't know. But he may have took three steps, man. And I heard the sound of a body when it hit rocks and slides. And okay he tripped and fell I'm, I'm 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 getting out of here i don't know what that was but i just know i've seen something could it have been my imagination possibly but because of the way i've seen it without getting a clear view of it i just knew i had seen something and it was black i took maybe six steps and herman said don't leave me it was nothing like what I just said. Nothing. I've never heard a human voice sound like that. It was it was something that just I, I couldn't leave him, man. Saying I, I couldn't leave him. It, it just was something. It hit me like in the core of my being that to leave him would be wrong. That's the best way I can put it. So I pumped my brakes and I slid a little bit and I spun around. And as I spun around, I bent over and I scooped up two handfuls of them rocks that was on the railroad tracks. And they were those white rocks. And I turned around and I ran back about maybe six steps and I got my arm cocked and I got my mouth open because I'm thinking, okay, that that dog, because Herman is now laying on his back, but he's propped up on his elbows and he's looking up like that. And I ran back, I got my arm cocked, you know, flinging the rocks and I got my mouth open and just start hollering, get, get out of here. And, get, and what I seen crouched over Herman, it, I, I stopped running and I'm looking like 
what the hell is that? Now, all I can see is this black outline, but it's absolutely stupid. <laughs> it, it was so big, Shane. It was so big, and I could clearly see the silhouette of the ears and the head, but I'm seeing shoulders like I got. I really couldn't see arms and hands or anything, but this thing got his face with his snout tucked down like that, right in Herman's face, look at him, right in his eyes. I mean, they couldn't have been no further than that apart. And Herman's not hollering, he's not screaming, he's not struggling, he is just laying there looking up, man, and all I can see is like the top of his head and that white t-shirt that he got on, uh, tank top he got on, I'm sorry. And I see his elbows, but it's in the gloom, just outside of the gloom, because he had ran, and when he fell, I guess, with him sliding, he's like maybe maybe three or four feet from being where I could see him good, but there was enough light that I could see what I just described. And I'm looking at this thing, man, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Excuse my French. What what the hell is that? If that's a dog, that is the world record of dogs. This thing. <sighs> you know, at that time, I didn't know what I was looking at. I'm thinking dog, but if that's this black dog that them came out of the junkyard, how the hell is that fence keeping it in? I mean, it dwarfed Herman. He looked like an 18 year old standing over a child that was between three or four years old, but a good size 21 year old, you know, somebody that was in shape. And Herman's not moving. And the other dudes don't stop running now. And I hear them, what the F is that? What is that? What is that thing? I can hear them and they're cussing and everything. I mean, it's real colorful. Now, I'm standing directly in the middle of the tracks and I'm looking at this thing because I'm trying to figure out what I'm seeing. It's not moving. It's not mauling him. It's not doing anything. It's just staring at him. And... I'm looking and I'm trying to figure out what is this thing? What is this? Is, is, is that is that the dog that, you know, my mind is just, I'm trying to make sense. And sometimes when you see something, your mind immediately goes to the closest thing that resembles that. If you see a dog, a coyote, a wolf, first thing come to your mind, that's a dog, a coyote, a wolf, it's some kind of canine. If you see a horse, a donkey, a jackass, something like that, okay. That's a um equestrian. I believe I'm saying that right, but you you yeah, always got no, something you that are. you can associate what you're seeing with. And the closest thing I could come to was a dog. So as I'm looking at this trying to figure it out, and these dudes is hollering and screaming, and I hear somebody say, don't shoot it. Don't shoot it. And I'm like, please don't shoot it because I'm standing in the middle of these railroad tracks. I don't know where, how they're positioned behind me because I'm not taking my eyes off it. And as soon as that dude said that, this thing stopped focusing on Herman and raised his head and it took two steps forward. It was on all fours. I seen this hand come out of the gloom. And yes, I said hand. I'm not talking about no Paul. I'm talking about a five finger hand like I have only three times this size with claws on it about that long. Wow. Now they were curved, but they weren't wickedly curved like that. They were, they were curved, but they had just enough curve in them that when they put his hands down on the rocks, 
that the tip of the finger would make contact with the ground, not the rocks, but maybe it's because they were uneven. But I've seen this, and it's like it happened. It's, you know when a tiger or a lion is stalking something, moving like that? That's how it eased forward. It was such a smooth move. Though. I mean, it was almost a glide, but yet not a glide because it was coming slow, but it was with purpose. And it put one hand down, and then it put the other hand down, and it came out. And when I'm seeing the hands and these long-ass forearms, I mean, from the wrist to the elbow is longer than from the elbow to the shoulder. And I'm looking like, what the? I said, no, no, what the? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm cussing, but I'm not saying it loud. I'm more in my head. I'm like, no, no, and. As it came forward like that, the head comes out of the gloom, and then I can see the head fully. But as soon as the light hit 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 the eyes, that's when they started that glow. It wasn't an internal glow. It was from the light. And I see these eyes that are about golf ball size. And they're the color of, of the white full moon, and then a yellow full moon, not the orange full moon, but a yellow full moon. If you take them two colors and combine them perfectly, that's what the eyes look like with a black pupil. And this thing is looking right at me. The head was approximately 22, 24 inches wide. And it had a small ruff around it, not not what I would call a mane, but a small ruff outlining the head, and I, that's why I believe the head was so big, but I see the ears good, no tufts of hair on top of the ears, not at all. The best description I could give you of the head as far as the shape would be, if we were talking about a canine, would be Alaskan Malamute, that broad snout not narrow like a doberman pincher german shepherd but that broad snout that they have and it wasn't really long it probably was mm, mm, 10 between 9 and 11 inches long but it was broad and i couldn't see any teeth because the, the mouth was closed but this thing is looking me dead in my eyes and I'm standing there looking and I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding. Are you serious right now? And when it came forward, that, that full second step, her hindquarters were actually right over Herman's face. So he could have told you about the genitalia if it had a tail, I never seen a tail. But he would be the one to tell you about the lower workings. I, I just didn't see that. But when I saw this thing, I'm like, okay, just like this in my head is what I said. Okay, I'm looking at a werewolf. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a werewolf, and I'm getting ready to die. The muscles that she had in her forearms, the, her hair was about two inches long or fur if you prefer, but hair. But you could clearly see the definitions in the forearm. You could clearly see the muscles bunched and everything. And I'm like, good God, her forearm had to be that big around, man. Wow. I mean, she was big in biceps. I mean, she was, when people say these things are jacked, they're not lying. They're not lying. She looked like she could have to did whatever she wanted to all of us and there wouldn't have been a damn thing we could have done and i'm standing here and i stood there and peed on myself wow i was just that scared because when she came forward that put her less than 10 feet away from me and i got a real good look at her she was jet deep, that jet black, but it's really 
strange to try to describe how something is so black that it looked like it, it can eat light. Because I could see her, if a black Labrador had been up under that light, there would have been a, sh um, you would have been able to clearly see it. But and I could clearly see her, but it wasn't with the same definition that you could because it actually seemed like her coat was devouring some of the light or deflecting it sometimes. I'm not sure, but when she looked at me, that was not an animal looking at me. I've had dogs a long time. I got one right now, man, over here, eavesdropping on my conversation. And I know what a dog look like when it look at you. They recognize you, but I also know what a human being, how a human being looks at you, and they recognize you. It looked at me like it knew me. I don't, I, I don't have anything to prove that with, but that was what I felt at the time. And the dudes is, they really hollering and screaming now because now they can see what I'm seeing. I guess they must have moved to the left and the right on the track where they can see around me, but they really, man, what the, you know, what the heck is that? The monster. All of this stuff I'm hearing because everybody's talking at once. I'm not saying anything now because I'm the closest one to it. And I'm thinking I'm getting ready to die. I mean, Batman ain't going to show up. Superman ain't going to be there. I needed a hero, a show <laughs> hero. Or God, can you please come down in your chair and take me away? Can, will you show up holding your son? Well, can you please show up holding your hand, son, and tell this thing to leave? That wasn't going to happen. So I'm like, you, <laughs> what you going to do, Roy? And I was kind of kicking myself slightly for stopping when I started running. I just slightly because I'm like, okay, you came back to Giddy, saving whatever you was going to do, Roy. You committed. But when you did that, now it looked like you're going to pay for it with your life. And I, when you know she when she looked at me, she did hold my gaze, but then she looked at everybody. She did a, a a quick sweep with her head with a slight hiccup in it, like that. Meaning she looked at each and every one of us, and then she looked back at me. Dude said, "Don't shoot it," but he must have either pointed that gun at it again or he never stopped pointing the gun. Her whole demeanor changed. She laid her ears back, and that's when she did that grin that dogs do when somebody about to get bit. And that's when I got to see her dental work. Shane, have you ever seen any pictures or photographs of a, a, a African male lion's teeth no, I don't think I have. Just the canine. Know, long, you know how big they are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Her her canines was about three, three and a half inches long. They had to be big around as my ring finger. And all the rest of the teeth in her mouth, including the ones between the fangs. They weren't like a dog's teeth. You know, you can look at a dog's teeth and tell they got molars and stuff in the back. All of her teeth were cutting teeth, like a shark got in this mouth. And it, they were interlocked like that. Wow. When she raised her jaws, I could see this. That's how close she was to me. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm really going to die now. But her teeth were... Pearly white. I didn't see any gum build up or anything. They were pearly white, man. In all actuality, her overall physical appearance, it looked like she just left from the groomers. I didn't see any grass, any weeds, no debris in her coat at all. She actually looked like she had just got brushed. Now, as I'm looking at Roy, are you there? 
Looks like we got some technical difficulty. Let's see. You there, brother? Uh, you there? Okay. Okay, I'm here. I'm okay. here. Sorry can you see that. me? Yeah, I can see you now. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, you're All good, right. brother. That's okay. All right. So, um, her teeth, well, her overall appearance was, like I said, it looked like she had just got out the groomers, man. She didn't look ratty. She looked healthy. I seen her size rise and fall. I could hear her breathing. And when that dude said don't shoot her and she changed her demeanor, she let out a growl. It wasn't real loud. It was low and rumbling, but I felt it in my body. I don't know if it hit me in my chest and went down to my feet or hit me on my feet and came up, but I could feel it. But it was low like she was warning us, but she didn't want to draw any more attention if there was anybody else around, which there wasn't to us, but we were close enough to the edge of the railroad tracks that if somebody had a drove across the railroad tracks and looked to their left or their right, they could have seen us and that thing standing on the railroad track. All of that hollering and screaming that we was doing, it seemed like somebody in one of them houses would have heard us and looked out their back door. Nobody. Nothing. And I'm, I'm looking at her breathing, seeing her move, and then she growled Okay, well, I peed on myself again. <laughs> wow. And then I started trying to think of, actually, I'm sorry, I'll take that back. I didn't urinate on myself again at that point. i take that back. Oh. When she growled and I started thinking, okay, how am I going to get out of this situation? Behind, remember I said earlier, behind those buildings, there's this chain link fence that goes up and it's got those three stranded barbed wires at the top. Well, if you could scale that fence, you're going to get chewed up on that barbed wire a little bit, but you can actually get to the top. And that middle building, you could jump from the, that um, fence onto that building and run across the top and drop down and be right next to the airline highway. We Roy, you there, bro? Sorry, guys. It uh, looks like we got another technical difficulty. David, Texas. What's up, brother? Carlito. What you doing, brother? Glad you're here. Thanks for joining. Miriam, thank you. Oh, it says his device got disconnected. Um, let's see. Let me resend him another invite. Bear with us. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I came back. Um, I don't know what happened, but, you know, seeing that thing and trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of this. So I, I know I shuffle my feet because I'm like, I'm just going to make a break for that fence and Hopefully I can get to the fence and at least get a hold to it before she be on me. When she heard me shuffle my feet, she stopped looking past me and looked directly at me. And the feeling that I got was, go ahead, run. Try it. Run. See how far you get. Go ahead, run. And that's when I urinated on myself again. My heart started pounding so loud that I could not hear anything around me. I thought I went deaf for a minute. 
until I realize that my heart is beating so loud that it's actually making me deaf. That's how scared I was when she looked because that look was, I won't say pure evil, but there was an evil intent to me there. But almost like a cat play with a mouse. Go ahead and run. Like I said, what I was seeing did not have We lose you again, Roy. Sorry, guys, we're having technical difficulties. I think it's, I don't know if it's his internet connection or his headphones. Let's see. Roy, you there? Okay. Oh, are you there? Exactly. All right. Okay. Actually, that yeah. was me that time. Um, yeah, that was me that time. I'm sorry. My, I had to plug my hotspot in. I didn't realize oh. that. It was yeah, you're good other time, I think that was me that time. So I'm standing here looking at this thing it's looking at me and excuse me it just it's it's not an animal looking at me it's in the form of an animal to a certain extent but it's got shoulders it's got hands like i do not right these raccoon paws that some people say it's got hands like I do. It's just that they're a lot bigger than me with them claws. And when it looks at you like it knows what you're thinking, that's a whole different ball game, Shane. That's a whole different ball game to just a, a normal big dog is going to come and maul you, man. You know when a dog raises it, show you his teeth, either he's scared or somebody about to get bit. And during all of this, Herman hasn't moved. He hasn't moved. He hasn't made a sound, at least none that I heard. These guys are still yelling and hollering. I'm having thoughts go through my head bullet train fast because I got to come up with one perfect plan to get the hell out of here. I couldn't think of one other than to try to hit that fence. And then when it looked at me, not that I heard a voice in my head, telling me, if you run, I'm going to get you. It was based strictly on the look that she gave me. Now, during all of this time, I didn't know this was a female. I had no clue. I just knew it was a big freaking werewolf on these railroad tracks getting ready to kill me. I done peed on myself. Nobody's coming to save me. You get ready to die, and you're going to die in the worst possible way, Roy, because you're going to feel every bite. You're going to feel every rip. You're going to feel every shred. You're going to die in a bad way, bro. I don't know. 
Maybe she thought that dark meat was juicier or something. I have no idea, man. But she looked at me and stopped focusing on Herman. And the other guys is just like, it sounded like they was freaking out, but I can understand why they was in the state they was in. Y'all back away from me. I'm the closest one. I'm the first one she going to get. She could have hit me with one hand and detached my head from my shoulder with one swing, and she might not even use all of her strength. That's how strong this thing was, in my opinion, because yeah. she was jacked, and I'm just trying to figure out, I, I I guess I got to a certain point where I started, my life started flashing before my eyes while I was making my peace with God. God, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to see you. I'm going to be the one that's in the 33-gallon garbage bag in little bitty pieces. But I'm coming to join you, God. That was the feeling that I'm, there was no reason in my mind at that time that I was not getting ready to die, just based on her growl and the way she looked at me. But it didn't happen like that. Now, this whole encounter had to take last five, six minutes. Because we stood there for a long time just looking at each other. She didn't make any uh, really overt, aggressive moves toward us other than when that dude pointed that gun. And I did hear somebody take off running. I'm not turning around and looking and see who it is because she flipped one of her ears, her one of her ears twitched because you could hear him when he started beating feet down the railroad tracks. I, don't, I didn't know who it was at the time, but I'm not taking my eyes off this thing in front of me. The weirdest thing happened next. Well, if what I just said wasn't weird enough. If you got a dog and they got fleas and they happen to be sitting next to you or just sitting away from you and they make that real quick move and start biting at the base of their tail or on their haunches like they got fleas or something. It's a real quick move. They go from sitting still or laying down and they just whoop and their head is back there and they gnawing. She did that motion, but not like she's chewing on her hindquarters because she got fleas. It was the twitch that she did. She twitched. Uh, just she. It was like, <laughs> and then she looked over into the thistles and stood up. And I'm looking, watching her go up, up. Up and I'm like, bro, you <laughs> you dead three times now. This <laughs> thing got to be at least wow. nine, nine and a half feet tall. I played basketball for a long time in my life before my knee wouldn't allow me to do it anymore. I know the standard basketball rim is 10 feet tall. She could have dunked the basketball without jumping and she would have had arm room to spare. If she reached her arm straight up above her head, I'm going to say she would have been 15, 16 feet from the ground to the tip of her claws. Wow. And absolutely massive. And that's when I seen the four breasts and I got to see more details on her. Now, her coat was black, but there were splashes of gray in it, but like a quilt work pattern. There's no basic pattern, just a color here and a color there, but it was just a splash on it here and there around her chest. And she had four breasts like a human woman. It was not the breast of a dog that's been nursing. It was not the breast of a woman that's had a lot of kids. They weren't sagging breasts. They were breasts like a chick that goes to the gym on a regular basis, but she's just working out to stay fit, mostly doing aerobics and stuff with a little weight lifting, but they were spaced apart far enough where I could take my hand and slide it up under the first one, and the second one will be right here. That's about how far apart they were. Now, I didn't look any lower to see if she had any more, but I've seen four breaths. When she stood up, they bounced one time, and that was it. And then she's looking to her right, and I'm looking at her shoulders. She had abs because she came down into a V-shape 
and then I seen the the top part of the lower half, which was the hocks of a dog and the thighs of a dog, and they were just dudes. Her thighs had to be <laughs> God. Mm. I'm trying to think of they were bigger than mine, but I I, I just can't I, I can't show it on the screen how far I'm holding my hands for these out, but her thighs were dude, they were massive. I mean you can see all kind of muscle cuts in her leg. I mean, she was jacked. Pure muscle. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, whatever you were meant to do in this world, you're perfect at it. But she was also, to a certain degree, beautiful. That was one of the most beautifulest things that I've seen with the way how fluid she was when she moved because when she stood up, she went straight to hell up, and it was within a blink of the eye, and she whipped her head to the right, and she's looking over in the thistles. So I'm looking at her now and getting to see everything else in great definition because, like I said, she couldn't have been no more than seven to eight feet from me at this time. Mm -hmm. So I can see her real good, and she's out. And But the only thing I can't describe to you is her feet because I only look down to the thighs, and then I went right back up to her head. So it was like a, oh my God. And that's long. Her arms had to be five and a half feet long from shoulder to, to the end of her head. They had, they was long, dude. I mean, I'm like, that's how she was able to be down over Herman like that without looking awkward or anything because she had her elbows out to the side like this, like she was going to do a push up, but she was right down in his face. And then when she came forward into the light, it took a minute for the rest of her body to come into the light because of the length of her arm. But when she came in, I'm looking like, damn, you know, hot hand and sneeze. Look at this damn thing. <laughs> My mind blown. Biscuits baked, taters mashed. My mind is blown. <laughs> and when I seen exactly what I saw, dude, and I'm here to tell you right now, I've never been that scared in my life. Never. Just, just thinking about what she could have done to me, all of us. And I'm thinking about running. You know, God forbid I, I would have ran off and left Herman, but if I could have, I would have ran. My mind is telling me to run. And my body's like, we're not going anywhere. It's like my body locked up on me when she looked at me that second time because I was going to make that dash toward the fence. But when she looked at me, after I heard her growl, my body just wouldn't respond to what my mind was telling me. So as she's looking over in the thistles, I took and snuck a peek and looked myself. And I seen It's it's really weird, man. But I seen six lights, but not like a street light or a lamp light. It was they were round. But a lot of people seem to think that she had pups. From her physical description, she never had any pups because she would have had saggy breasts if werewolves have saggy breasts. But what I've seen look like if you take the reflector off a bicycle, the red reflector, and take a black magic marker and start in the center and start coloring it in until you're about an eighth of an inch from the edge. It was a thin red light, but it was six of them. But it was in a triangle formation. There were two in the middle, two to the left, and two to the right. But they was back in them thistles about 60 maybe 70 yards, but because it's so black back there, I could really see them red lights. And I looked and I'm like, what the F is that? What is that now? And then I quickly looked back at her. She never looked back, but she did turn and look back at us for a high second. And then she slightly crouched and jumped. 
and she came down in them thistles about 18 to 20 feet, and she hit the ground running, but she was on all fours because I couldn't see her standing up. Or either that or she was crouched over. But she was going so fast, dude, she was laying them thistles down, and they popped right back up. No damage. I didn't hear her running through them. She laid them down, but you could see from the railroad track, they was popping right back up. So you could see until she got, I don't know, about 75 yards, maybe 80, that the thistles popped right back up. And then I don't know if they stopped moving or I stopped looking, but when she got that far away, I immediately ran to Herman because I'm like, okay, she gone. It's time for us to get the hell out of here. The other guys snap out of it. They come running down. And I'm like, Herman, Herman, hey, Herman, you okay, Herman? Herman, you all right? Herman's not responding. His eyes is looking glass. He got a little bit of drool coming out of his mouth. But he's not trying to get up. He's not trying to talk. He's not doing something. I mean, it's like he had checked out, man. So we got to pull him up off the ground. I put his arm around my shoulder and I'm turning. So we going to go back to the park. I don't know what, I don't know what they was thinking at the time on the reason why we didn't go back to the park at that time. Cause that is what made the most sense to me, but not at that time because of what had just happened. Now I've seen a monster. I'm not about to take off and go myself. I, I got straight herd mentality. There's strength in numbers, and I know for a fact I'm faster than four of y'all. So if that thing show back up, I'm running this time. I'm running this time. And whoever come up last, that's your ass, Mr. Postman. That's your <laughs> ass. But I'm not sticking around. So as it they turned and started going further down the tracks in the direction this thing that went. Now, she left at an angle, but she was going straight toward those lights. And when I looked over there again, I didn't see the lights anymore. I don't know where they went. I didn't see any orbs, any UFOs, anything like that, but them lights was gone. So they saying, they start walking, talking about, okay, come on, let's get down here to the liquor store. We'll call the police from there. Okay, let's go. But we got to go further down the tracks, past that third light to where we're in blackness now. And then we got to cut through this field of thistles to get to the liquor store. Um, I are, um, um, y'all want to go through the thistles, but that's where, okay, I'm going with y'all. All I know is if she show back up, I'm running. So, we walking and we have dragging Herman because he's not even trying to help us. He's he's pretty much just limp. Every now and again, he might halfway try to take a step because they, you know, the dudes are talking to him. Herman, come on, Herman, what's wrong, dude? Herman, say something, Herman. Herman ain't saying nothing. So we go down the tracks and we got to go through these thistles, but because I guess they lived in the neighborhood, they haven't been going this way so much. They have worn the uh, ground down to where it was just bare dirt. And you can walk two abreast through this area to come out into the back of the liquor store. And it wasn't really that far other than, because I didn't realize that as you went further down the thistles, it was 150 yards to my best estimate at that time. It actually shrank down to maybe about 50 yards where we had to go through them. So we didn't have to walk through 150 feet but this was, thank God. <laughs> and I'm looking around, my heart is pounding, my shoes is squishing, my converse is squishing because they full of urine. <laughs> and man. I'm just, man, Shane, I'm just like, dude, I'm like, what this, what, what happened? I'm trying to process this, but now I'm kind of wondering, what the hell did it do to Herman? But because of the lighting condition and how dark it was, and we was walking as fast as we could get, we exit out the thistles and show up to the back of the liquor store. 
thank God there's two lights on the back of there and there's a car park back there. And I'm like, thank God. So we get around to the front of the liquor store. And that's when I'm trying to find out what time is it. So I looked in the store. It's like 1252. And the liquor store closed at one o'clock. We left out of the park at 1230, maybe 1233. Because they stood there trying to count their money up and then we were trying to decide what kind of beer we was going to get or if we had enough, we were going to get a bottle and a case of beer. So we was, you know, having a little confidence about that. So that encounter lasted a whole lot longer than I would ever want any encounter to last. But I'm here today after having that. But we get around to the front of the liquor store. There's a little ledge on the front of the liquor store and they, we put Herman on that. And I got my hand in his chest because if I had to let him go, he going to place plant straight in the concrete. He's not even able to sit up on his own pocket. But I'm craning my head like this to look through the window because three of the dudes went in there. As soon as they went in there, they all start talking at once to the cashier. Man, there's a call. Man, can I use your phone to call the police? There's a monster on the red. We just seen a werewolf. There's a werewolf running around. There. But we all talking at once and the dude is like this. And he said, listen, he said, it's close to closing time. I don't know what y'all been smoking, what y'all been shot up, what y'all been snorting. Make your selections, bring it up here so I can ring you up, and then you can leave out the store. And Diamond was the one that was most vocal. He said, stupid MF, did you not hear what I just said? There's a monster on the railroad track my our friend is out here. We don't know what's wrong with him. So will you, if you won't let us use the phone, would you call the police? Call somebody. The dude said, I don't have no time for this nonsense. I don't know what y'all trying to pull. Either buy something or get out because I'm getting ready to close. They come out of the store and stuff, and he walked over to the door behind him. As soon as they came out, he locked the door. And I'm like, hey, man, come here. Hold, Herman. Let me go and talk to him. Because they cussing like this MF, this MF, this man won't even let us use the damn phone. He all he got to do is call the police. So just before Little Bit came out, he turned. He said, "Hey, is that your car parked in the back?" And the clerk said, "Yeah, why?" He said, "Well, will you at least move your car around the front of the building, man, before we leave? Because there's a monster back there. I swear to God, there's a monster back there, man." Dude said, "Yeah, right, whatever, bye," and closed the door and locked it. I walked up to the door and I knocked on it. And he turned around, and looked at me. He went like that. I said, hey, man, listen, can you just call the police? I was doing this. He said, bye. I said, will you please call? Will you please call the police? Call someone. Call the fire department. Call somebody. He waved by me again and turned the sign around on the door, said close, and he went, opened up the register, and took the drawer out, and he started counting out the drawer. Then he looked at me like, you still here? You need to go. Now, if I had been thinking, I could have picked up a rock and threw it through the front of the window to encourage him to call the police. But I wasn't even thinking like that. I'm thinking, okay, we can't get no help from him. So what are we going to do now? Now, while I'm having this exchange with the clerk, I can hear the dudes talking, but because I'm focused on him, I'm not deciphering what they're saying. But once I got done with that, I was walking over and I heard little bit say, what is this white stuff in Herman's head? What's this white stuff right here? Because he was brushing at it. And I'm like, excuse me, let me see what's going on with her. And I looked and he, I seen this white patch in his head. So I rubbed at it. And I'm figuring because we've been walking on those white rocks on the railroad tracks that he fell. And it's just a patch of that white dust. Well, I took and licked my thumb and I wiped it in his head. None of it came off. And I rubbed a little bit. It didn't come off. So I took my hand and parted his hair, his hair had turned white all the way down to his scalp in a circle about that big. Wow. When I met him, Herman's hair was completely black. I played basketball with him for four hours that night. His hair was completely black. He sat next to me on the bleachers while we was talking that night, while we was waiting to get another game. And I looked at him in his face and his head. His hair was all black. 
yet he got a circle in his hair. Now, I, I mean, it was pure white. And I'm like, what in the hell? And we trying to snap him out of it, trying to snap him out of it. I mean, I gave him a couple of slaps while I was talking to him. I don't think I hit him too hard, but you know, I know I popped him a couple of times, but it was more like Herman, Herman. It wasn't no Herman, but he didn't respond, Shane. And I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with dude. I just, I, I don't know what to do for him. I said, well, okay, we need to get him home or at least I need to get back to my car because it's after one o'clock in the morning now. So we walking and they told me coming this way was a shortcut because in order to come to the liquor store taking the surface streets, you had to go down and walk over to Chef Mentor and then walk down Chef Mentor to get to the liquor store. That's going to take you about 30, 35 minutes. But because we got to drag Herman, it took us between 45 and 50 minutes to get back to the park. Wow. <clears throat> Every little sound we heard, Shane, we stop, we on alert, everybody looking and stuff like, man, did you hear that? Y'all heard it, be quiet. But in the meantime, everybody's talking. Man, that was an effing werewolf. Did you see that thing? Did you see when it stood up? It had titties. It had titties, man. Did you see that thing had titties? Everybody's talking at once, and I'm engaging with them, but for the most part, I got my head on the swivel, like, because we passing going through patches of darkness, but we own a neighborhood street, and we was in the street walking. We wasn't walking on the sidewalk. But it's housed on both sides of the street. And we walking along, and finally, we get to where the park is. And I'm like, thank God, there's my car. We walked through the park, exited on the other side, went right across the street, and the second house from the corner is where Herman lived. I'm like, okay, we got him home. We got him home. Everybody's okay. We, you know, everybody's alive. We got him home. I prop Herman up on the porch because everybody else went up on the porch and they knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell. Some of them was even hitting on the side of the house with their open hand. Bam, 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 bam. So after about a minute or two of that, the porch light come on and the door gets snatched open. Herman's mother is standing there in her. She had on a bathrobe, I believe. And she's like, who the hell is that beating on my damn door like this is time in the morning? What the hell wrong with y'all? Because it's almost 2 o'clock in the morning now. And she was not happy. Now, she's looking at them. And what the hell is wrong with y'all? What is it? And they all start talking at once. And she's like, she's looking at them. And she's like, Okay, shut up, shut up, shut up. You tell me what happened. Something's wrong with Herman. It was a monster. As soon as you said something wrong with Herman, she's like, what, something wrong with Herman? What do you mean something wrong with Herman? What's wrong with my baby? Now, I don't know this lady. She don't know me. I've never seen it before. But I'm standing here and I got her son propped up on the porch because I sat him down. And when we got to the liquor store, that's when we found out that he had peed and boo-booed on himself. Oh, wow. So... <laughs> I can understand why he did this. I can understand that in the position that he was in. He evacuated both his mouths. <laughs> I know I did. I, I, I stood there and peed on myself twice, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I don't know if that's let me lighten the load so I can really get the hell up out of here or if it's just fear because I was scared to death, man. I was terrified, and I never had that kind of terror in my life. She walks over and says, Herman, Herman, baby. And she shook him. Herman, baby. What's wrong with me? Asking me, Herman. Herman is just like this. And she's shaking me. And then he's sitting like this with his mouth open. Just like that. I got my hand in his chest. And she's like, oh, my God, what y'all done did to my son? Don't nobody leave. I'm getting ready to call the police. As soon as she said that, I grabbed Herman by his elbows and laid him back like that on the porch so his feet are dangling off the porch, but he's not going to slide off, but he's laid on the porch. And I turned around, and I walked out of her yard, and as soon as I hit the street, 
I hauled ass down to my car. There was three people in another house, about two houses down the street on the same side. And it was a dude and two women sitting on the porch. And I heard them say, I wonder where he running from. I didn't respond to them because they didn't say nothing to me. I ran straight to the truck of my car. And yes, in front of God and everybody else, I stripped out them wet underwear and them shorts. And I grabbed the shirts that I had on and put them on, jumped into my sandals. I got into my car. And when I left from the curb, my back wheels were spinning and smoking. I busted a U on the, the street. I shot straight down the airline highway. I didn't even stop for the stop sign. I went straight out in the traffic and I almost hit a car and another one almost hit me because the dude laid on his horn and I floored it. And I drove like that until I got home. As soon as I got in the house, I slammed the door and locked the deadbolt, locked the door knob. I drug the sofa over in front of the door, went into the kitchen, unplugged the refrigerator and drug that out of the kitchen and pushed it up in front of the couch and plugged it back in. I went in the closet. Got my speed loaders down and loaded three of them. Well, I only had three. And I put my pistol on the table. And then I went into the cabinet and got that Jack Daniels green label down. And I took three healthy swigs out of it. And then I poured me a shot and a half in uh, my glass. And then I started the replay of what had just happened. And a lot of what I wrote in my journal is gibberish and curse words. My handwriting. It's so poor because my hand is shaking because I made it alive. But now I got to figure out, is this thing going to come and get me? Because she was looking at me like she knew me. Now, the one thing that I left out is when that creature stood up and looked to its right, and looked in them thistles. There was a flash by her left ear. I'm never going to be 100% sure, but I am in the high 90s that there was a gold hoop earring in her left ear. Interesting. That flash of yellow is only caused by either a yellow tag, which I would have been able to see, I would have seen a yellow tag if it's like a tag that you tag cattle with, but a thin gold hoop has to catch light at a certain angle in order to flash. Like I said, I'm never going to be 100% sure, but I know I've seen a gold flash because when she spun her head like that, it kind of flared out like that and then came back down. And then I started looking at the rest of her. I ain't focusing on no damn earring when she got all of this other damn equipment to do her damage with. I'm more focused on her head because I know wherever she looked, that's where she's going to be going. And then she just took the hell off, man. So I'm sitting here trying to write. Hand look like I've been locked in the back of the freezer. I'm shaking so much and I'm drinking and spilling stuff. And I'm like, my mama and daddy lied to me. My mama and daddy lied to me. They told me my whole life that monsters don't exist. There's no monster in your closet. There's nothing up under your bed. There's nothing in the darkness waiting to come and get you, son. Yet I just seen a werewolf less than 10 feet away from me. I smelled her breath. It wasn't overpowering, but it smelled like she ate something and never, ever brushed. I smelled her breath. I heard her breathe. I heard her growl. I heard the noise that she made when she moved on them rocks, the, the slight crunch. I seen her when she stood up. I got a good look at this thing, man. It's branded in my brain. And for whatever she did to Herman, I can only imagine where his mind was. When that thing was crouched over him, looking in his eyes and I did whatever research I could, but after that, I didn't go outside at night. And every day I got home, I drug my sofa in front of the door. I pulled that refrigerator. I didn't actually put my refrigerator back in the kitchen. I just pushed it next to the couch and plugged it in because I knew I was going to be put in front of the door. But 
I always had my pistol out. That night, if I had a call and ordered a pizza and that delivery guy would have showed up, if he knocked on that door, I think with how much my, my how badly my hand was shaking, I probably would have put bullets all the way around that door frame, but I never would have been able to put one through the middle because I was in such a heightened state of fear. But if I had to be able to calm down and if I forgot I ordered a pizza, I would have killed somebody. I did not leave my house the next day, which was Sunday. I'm, no, I'm sorry, which was Saturday. I did not leave my house Sunday. I did not show up for work Monday. I didn't go back to work Tuesday because I was not mentally prepared to leave my house. I barely fixed me something to eat, but I constantly was drinking. I actually had bought two-fifths of Jack Daniels because they had them on sale. So I went through both of them over the weekend. And that's the only way I was able to pass out and go to sleep. I didn't lay down and go to sleep. I passed out drunk and went to sleep. As soon as I woke up, I'm reaching for my pistol and listening like, damn, Roy, you fucked up. You fell asleep. You said you weren't going to go to sleep. But there's a monster out there, dude, and she coming to get you. I didn't have no proof for that. It never told me it's going to come and get me. But yet, that's where my that's what my state of mind was. This monster is going to come back and finish you off. Why she let you go the first time, I had no idea. But when I went to work Tuesday, I did call in, and my boss said, well, are you okay? I said, I'm not feeling too good. I think I drunk too much. I think I gave her some BS story. But when I showed up, she was looking at me, and she could tell I was different. Because every little sound I heard, I jumped. And trust me, I did have my pistol with me. I had it in, tucked in the back of my pants because I had a long barrel 357. And I, throughout the day, she would, I would look up and I see her looking at me like, you no know, kind of with a puzzled look on her face. And she asked me, Roy, you okay? I said, absolutely not. She said, what's the matter? I said, if I told you, you'd fire me. I said, this normal happy-go-lucky guy that walked out of here Friday, if I told you what happened to me, you would fire me because you'd be like, oh, I made a mistake. I hired a lunatic. This boy's delusional. So she asked me the bad part of the day, Shane. Roy, what's the matter? You can talk to me. No, I can't. You ain't going to believe me anyway. I don't want to talk about it. But she stayed at me and stayed at me. So it was probably maybe an hour before I was supposed to get off. And she said, Roy, we'd had nobody was in the store. And she said, Roy, I'm like, yes, what is it? She said, did something bad happen Friday? I said, yes, it did. She said, let me ask you three questions and honest, answer me honestly. I said, what? She said, did you kill somebody? I said, absolutely not. She said, did you rape somebody? I said, absolutely not. What the hell? She said, did you experiment with any different kind of drugs? I said, no, I didn't. I said, come on now. She's like, listen, I can tell there's something wrong with you. I know you really don't have any family down here, but you can tell me what happened. And if you didn't kill nobody, you didn't rape nobody, then you shouldn't have to worry about going to jail. Did you see somebody get killed? I said, almost. She said, what happened? I said, if I tell you, you're going to fire me. I don't want to tell you what happened to me. She's like, Roy, just tell me what happened. But she wasn't, it was more like her being in a motherly demeanor rather than I'm your boss and you better tell me what happened. It was more like she kept coaxing me. Come on, Roy, you can talk to me. Just you tell me what say. happened. So I'm like, do you really want to know what happened? She said, yeah. Yeah, so she was on the other side of the counter and she had her hand like this and her other hand was on the top of the, the counter and she was like, what happened, Roy? And I told her. She never interrupted me. Her eyes never got wide. She never did that. <gasps> None of that. She just was like this the whole time. Oh, golly. She said, oh, you saw a loop guru. I said, woman, did you not just hear everything I just said? I'm not talking about no damn body named Lou. I've seen a monster. 
And she kind of smiled and she said, no, I didn't say Lou. I said, Lou, guru. I'm like, what the hell is that? That sounds like something you get when you don't take care of your feet. No, I'm just kidding when I said that. But <laughs> I just kind of looked at her like, what is that? She's like, that is the French terminology. <laughs> That's the, I, I had to do that, man, because I feel myself spiraling down telling this. So I just told that little joke. Just It was more for me than it was for you, but I, I feel that spiral coming. But she said, that's the French terminology for a werewolf. I said, I told you I seen a werewolf. I was like, what do you know about them? She said, well, my grandma told me that they are here and they came over here with the French people when they uh, decided to come to America. I said, okay, okay. Um, um, what, what, what's the deal with it? She said, well, if one bites you or scratch you, then you're supposed to be cursed and you're going to be one until you find the one that bit or scratch you and you got to kill it. And that's going to break the curse where you'll be able to come back to being a regular human being. She said, did you get bit or scratched? I'm like, nope, nope, I sure didn't. She said, I said, well, can they be killed? She said, well, I love this woman. I really do. I love her because her demeanor was so laid back. And the way that she said, well, with that little Southern draw, I, mm -hmm. I really appreciated and respected her, man. I really did. And she said, well, my grandmother told me you got to get some oil and some fire and some rock salt. I said, you're making fun of me now. She said, no, I'm not. I'm like, so I need some oil, some fire, and some rock salt. I ain't talking about having no barbecue werewolf. I want to know how to kill this damn thing. She said, bro, I'm not joking with you. I'm not making fun of you. I'm trying to tell you what my grandma told me. She said, I said, well, what the hell do I do with it? She said, you throw the rock salt on it, and new gurus are supposed to be highly allergic to rock salt. I said, okay. Then what? She said, then you put the oil on. I said, okay. And then what? She said, and then you set it on fire. I said, what? She said, then you set it on fire. I said, okay, that ain't going to work for me. She said, why not? I said, with the luck I got, I'll throw this rock salt on this thing and get it irritated and trying to, because rock salt is supposed to burn them, according to her. And while it's trying to get this rock salt off of it, then I got to put this oil on it, which I can put some oil in a water balloon and throw a couple on it and get, you know, get it soaked. I said, but with my luck, when I go to strike that damn match to light it on fire, the wind going to blow and the match going to go out. Now I got an oily, burning, pissed off loop guru that's really going to finish me off. That's not going to work. I'm like, is there any other way? What kind of gun can I use to kill him? She said, well, my grandma told me if you get some silver and get it blessed and get it made into some bullets, that's supposed to work. I said, okay, maybe that's something I can work. Let me, God said, if I can find me some silver. And she said, so that gal that came in here in the stuff, you think that she was that thing? I'm like, who else could it have been? She said, I'm not doubting you. I'm just wondering if that's what you think. And I'm like, yeah, she said, well, maybe it was her mama. I said, what? She said, well, I heard the girl say you couldn't call her at a house. You couldn't come by a house. But she was standing real close to her. So if she went home, and her mama smells you on her, then, and her daughter told her, I'm going to go to the park. She ain't going to tell her she's going to meet no boy, but she's going to the park around the corner, and she show up. She got your scent. So maybe that was her that showed up on the railroad tracks, and she was sending you a message to stay the hell away from her child. <laughs> I just looked at her, Shane, like, you just made this go from bad to worse. I don't even know what her mama looked like. But what I do know is this, and I told my boss, if that girl show up in this store, I'm going to blow her chest out her back, and then I'm going to put the rest of the bullets in this gun in her brain. 
She said, yeah. gun? I'm like, do you not think I don't have my gun with me? I got my, she said, bro, you can't have that pistol in there. I said, if I got a, can't have my gun in here, I quit. And she said, what? I said, I quit. She's like, no, you can't quit. She said, well, you just better keep it up under the counter. Don't let the customer see. So for the rest of the time I worked there, I had my gun with me, Shane. But every little sound I heard for the rest of that week, the following week, the week after that, I'm jumping and I'm looking. When that bell ring, I'm expecting that chick to walk through that door. She never showed up. She never called me. She never called the store. I never seen her. So that is why, in my mind, that woman was that werewolf that showed up. I don't know why she didn't do whatever she was planning on doing. I don't know why she was so focused on Herman, but with all of these years that I've went by, I've had plenty of time to think about it. My brother. And when your mind starts tripping a life fantastic to where you have to open that door in your head to accept the possibility, the possibility that this, this good girl could be this, the, 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 the mother could be this, for a minute there, I'm thinking that my boss has set me up because she never showed any any freak out moment when I was telling her. Her demeanor was so calm. I'm like, hell, maybe you called that chicken told her, hey, I got a new dude in town. He ain't got no relatives here. He's easy pickings and won't a lot of people look for him. Come on down here and meet him. I was looking at any and every possibility that I could to figure out what this thing was. But because I didn't have any 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 no 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 researchers no experts so-called experts nobody that i could reach out to if i call the police and tell them what i've seen they might show up with them dudes with them jack them white jackets with the extra long sleeves and take me for a vacation i'm not gonna tell them so i started doing research in the library and the only thing i could come up with at this time there was so little reading material on werewolves was either books on witchcraft or demonology and I read a lot of them. Didn't find any too much information to tell you about a werewolf. So, dude, I had to figure out all of this stuff on my own. And because I was so young and had never, ever seen anything like this, my grandparents never told me about no werewolves or anything. But what I found out is if you out and about in New Orleans, if you stop at one of these little cafes on the side and you actually sit and listen long enough, you can pick up bits and pieces of stuff. Or if you walk up to somebody and say, hey, can I ask you a question? But I was smart enough to say, I'm doing a paper for school and I'm trying to get a good grade. Can you tell me anything about a loop guru? I found plenty of people that'd be willing to talk to me about this. Wow. But they also talked about vampires. They also talked about demons, spirits, everything. So I got a lot of, if you will, firsthand information from these people about demons, about spirits, about voodoo. Voodoo in Louisiana is a viable thing for them. People actually believe in it. If you piss somebody off and they go see the right person, if did that person tell you, okay, I cursed them, they go, they curse is gonna activate in. 26 hours. Something usually happened to that person along the lines of what the curse is supposed to be. Wow. <laughs> I haven't, can't say I've seen it firsthand, but I've seen the after effects of this. So Louisiana just has such this mystery and, and just, just creepiness about it, but it also has a smell because it rains so much, man. There's always the smell of rotting vegetation in the air. So if that thing did have a smell, which I never noticed on her, I wouldn't have really been able to smell it because of just that that overpowering sense of decay that was around her. I kind of think that's why God sent hurricanes down there to kind of clean the city every so often because there is a definite smell in the air. And Shane, the next three years of my life were really not worth living. I ended up dropping out of school. My grades failed because I'm drinking. 
I couldn't play football like I wanted to because we go to a visitor stadium. I spend more time looking up in the stands trying to figure out is that chick up there or which one of these 30,000 people in the stands is going to sprout fur and fangs and just come down here and get me. I'm looking up under the bleachers and the coaches call me, Stubblefield, you in? What are you doing? Get your head out your hindquarters. Get in the game. Coach, I'm sorry, man. Well, what's wrong with you, dude? I don't know, man. I just had a bad day. I never told anybody else what happened to you. But everything started spiraling it down, and I kept my job. But I think year three, I was on my way to work. And I almost rear-ended somebody because I was trying to reach over the back seat and drive and get my, my little, I bought me a little flash that I used to fill up with Jack Daniels. I'm getting ready to start drinking now before I go to work. It's already bad enough when I go to lunch. I go out and sit in my car. I don't eat nothing. I just drink. As soon as I get home, I drink, and I was just eat enough. I started losing weight, man. Damn. But whenever it started getting dark, I don't care who I was with, where I was at. It's time to go home. And I wasn't dating any chicks because at this time, I'm like, I can't take a chance. I can't take a chance on meeting another chick, and she be one of these times. So my life was hell. It was purity hell. The only thing that kept me kept me from spiraling all the way down that rabbit hole was my friend Jack Daniels Green Label. And when I got to the point of where I got a drink before I go to work, I went home that same day and I poured out the five bottles of Jack Daniels that I had, the two fifths of rum I had and the Tennessee whiskey I bought. I poured it all down the drain, and I said, enough of you. Y'all not going to keep me in this state that I'm in. Y'all got to go. And, of course, I had to go through the DTs for about eight, nine days. But after that, I started climbing back up. So I know there's more to having an encounter than just seeing this thing, smelling this thing, Seeing what it did to Herman, seeing, hearing how them other dudes were screaming, I know, depending on your psyche, it can break you down and make you doubt a lot of things. But the one thing I never doubted in all of this was God. Never. So having said all of that, I'm going to wrap it up with this. We were talking the other day, and I had said to you, that's one time somebody said to me, why didn't he go back and check on Herman? The reason I never went back and checked on Herman is this. I didn't run off and leave this dude. I had just met him that night. I stayed there. I ran back to save him from what I thought was a dog that was attacking him, not no monster. I got him home to his mother. In one piece, he was not a sound mind, but he was a sound body. I did everything that I was supposed to do for a person that I considered cool enough to be a friend, but he wasn't my friend. He wasn't even an acquaintance. If we had to spend more time together, I'm sure we would become friends. I did what I did because that dude screamed, don't leave me. I got him home. Now it's time for Roy to take care of his black ass. And my grandmother always told me, if you get yourself in a situation, boy, and it could cause you to lose your life, and by the grace of God you get out of it, don't take your fool ass back there. Because you might not be as lucky the second time. So I never, never went back to Metairie, Louisiana. There was no reason for me to go to an area where I know there's a monster running around. So that's why I never went back for Herman. I did everything I was supposed to do for him that night. Obligation field, taters mashed, biscuits browned. Now it's time to take care of Roy. And that is my encounter, Shannon. Interesting. I'm glad you kicked the drinking though after a while, brother, and didn't let it take over, you know, you, you know. And a uh, couple questions I I had before 
Uh, looks like the guests had quite a few questions too. But uh, one of the questions was, have you been back or heard anything about Herman? Yes. I didn't go back, but I found out what happened to Herman. And it nobody should have to live their life like that. I thought I had it bad. Now, I never spoke with Herman again. I never spoke with any of those other guys again. But through the mysteries of the universe and God, somebody put me in touch with his son. He's in his 30s now, and that young man needs all the prayers that anyone can give him because not only does he not believe in cryptids, he believes that we gave his father something that put him in that state that night, and we robbed him of a normal father. I've never had anybody talk to me the way that dude talked to me in the three conversations we had. And I tried to be extremely patient with him being called the N word, stupid. Um, um, you, 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 you bastard. You, 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 you piece of crap. You took my father from me. Dude, what are you talking about? What, what happened? Tell me what happened while you making all these accusations. He said, my father would jump in shadows. If he heard a loud noise, he'd drop to the ground and cover up. Sometimes he would be lucid, but for the most part, he, he just would stare off into space a lot. I'm like, what? Yeah, dude, y'all did that to him. Would y'all give him some, some mushrooms? Was y'all huffing paint that night? It was I shooting up? Did I give him a bad dose of heroin or something? All of this stuff. And I'm like, dude, did the other guys tell you what happened? Yeah, and, and I blame them too. Herman only lived another seven and a half years. Wow. He died from a heart attack. His, Do you think the his, events from that night? His, his uh, 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 child's mother. Oh. Yes, you got to remember, this thing was looking him in his face for a minute, looking dead in his eyes. I don't know if she was feeding on his soul or what, man. But she was this close to him. And she was ignoring us at the time. She wasn't worried about me running from with a handful of rocks. She didn't react until somebody said, don't shoot it. So I don't know what occurred between them, but Herman's mind snapped. And he never was able to bridge the gap according to what his son told me. Now, I got lucky finding him because he lives in Texas now. But one of my peoples knows some people that know some people. And when I believe it was Katrina happened and all of them people left from Louisiana, he ended up in Texas. And he said that he had been in contact with them other dudes for a short time, because they would come by and check on him when he was little. But after they uh, spread out, he you know left his cell phone and all of that stuff, and um, he just don't have the telephone numbers and stuff. He said, but if I had them anyway, I wouldn't give them to you. I know there's no such thing as monsters in this world. You are responsible for my father being the way that he was, and don't try to send me no cockamamie story, and I'm paraphrase when I say cockamamie because he said something a lot worse. Mm -hmm. But you and the other dudes is responsible for my father dying. But Herman had a heart attack one night. He said that he was in his bedroom. And if your child's mother can't trust you by yourself with your son, that means you're not mentally stable if she can't trust you with your son. And he said he said to me, he said, it's out there in the backyard. And by the time him and his grandmother got back there to the back of the house, Herman was laying on the floor and he was like clutching his chest and stuff. 
and he passed away before the paramedics got there. I cried when that dude told me that. And then he started calling me old soft punk, and I need to shut up with them crocodile tears and stuff like that. And I'm like, are you serious right now? So I don't know <clears throat> what happened, but it just, hold on, I'm still here. It just took me somewhere that I really didn't know what, what I really didn't know, man, what the hell to do with that. And when you, when you realize just how much terror that he was in, I, I can only imagine, man, his life. I mean, he did tell me about they went to the drive, the movies one night, not the drive in. And they went to the 10 o'clock showing, and it was him and his mom and Herman, and they were leaving from the theater to walk back to the car. And Herman thought he'd seen something in the shadows, and he just took off running. But his main <clears throat> overlying fear was railroad tracks after that. If he was sitting on the passenger seat and they went across the railroad tracks, he said he would slide all the way over down there in the driver's seat or next to whoever was driving and say, get me away from these freaking railroad tracks. Get me away from these freaking railroad tracks. And he would keep repeating it. Wow. So it made me cry, man. It made me literally cry. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, and you think that we gave your father something that would put him in such a state? Ain't no such thing as no freaking werewolves. Ain't no Bigfoot. That all, yeah. all that stuff is just on TV and in the movies. Dude, you from Louisiana, and you don't believe this? F you, dude, F you, F you. If I ever see you, I've got some lead for you, too. Wow. I said, you know what, young man? That's the last time I'm going to let you threaten me. I'm going to pray for you, but I will never bother you again. Never. But I do, I said, but I want you to do me one favor, because he had pissed me off then. He said, I don't owe you no favor. I'm like, no, you don't, but just do me one favor, please. He said, what? I said, take your ass to East Texas, get you a tent, Did we lose you, Roy? Bear with us really quick, guys. I don't know if it's my end or his end. Let's see. Back. All right. Hey, there we go. We got you. Yeah. So, yeah, Shane. That that's what happened to to poor Herman, and I don't never want to talk to his son again because I don't want that negative energy, man. That dude, he is. I honestly feel like if he ever seen me. The only way I would walk away from that encounter would be I'm faster on the draw than him. Mm -hmm. That's what I honestly believe. And that's a really sad thing because I did what I was supposed to do for your father at the time, dude. I did what I was supposed to do. And you... You blaming me for your father dying? No, no, I, I I did what I was supposed to do, and you're more than welcome to think whatever you want to think about me, but 
when you get a chance to stand in front of God, I hope he asks him, is them dudes responsible for my dad being like that? And let God answer his question. But I know what I did. And I could have run off and left his father. But, but I didn't. didn't. So exactly. That's, that's what happened to Herman. But I, but I really feel bad for him still to this day. I bear him no ill will. He's allowed to feel however he want to feel because it is hard for a seven and a half year old boy or a boy almost eight years old to see his father dead on the floor in front of him. And to see how his father acted when you really got old enough to know that, okay, my dad is acting weird. So I feel for him, but I'm not going to let him kill me. No. So I, I, but that's what happened to Herman. The rest of the guys, excuse me, is the main reason why I share my account is on the platforms I've shared it. Because if one of them dudes hear what happened, or somebody that knows one of them dudes hears what happened, and they say, hey, that dude that you, that you told me about was on the railroad track with that, when y'all had that thing happen, I heard him on. Oh, looks like we lost him. Let's see if he'll call back in. Some other invite. Thank you, everyone that's shown up tonight. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get to the comments as soon as he gets back on. Oh, here we go. There you go, buddy. All right. Here we go back. Um, I don't know what's going on, but um, I it's see no. I was looking in the comment section and I see that um, I wanted to respond to this question. I was looking in there. Hold yeah, on which one was it? Um, somebody asked. Come on, comments. Somebody, the uh, casual conversations with GNA said, has he been attacked by cryptids or entities? Or was he referring to me? When they ask that? Um, I'm, that's what I'm wondering. I, I think casual conversation um, was with GNA was asking if you had been attacked by cryptids or entities. Um, th that was the only cryptid attack, if you will call it an attack, but I'll just say encounter that I had. And if you consider werewolf a cryptid, okay, because the reason oh. I'm sticking to werewolf is this. I've never seen or heard of a dog, a female dog man that had four breasts or that was that big or wearing jewelry, if you will, if what I seen in her ear was in fact an earring. But as far as the entities go, um, I have had to deal with a demon. Um, if you guys will go to my YouTube channel, I have a video posted there about something that happened that was going on with my car and it went on for months and I have some other pictures that I could share of my car while some of these things is going on and you can tell me what the hell this is going on with my car because I can't figure it out but I actually seen a demon last year I wow. saw a demon and I know where it came from for the most part. I know who it was attached to and 
we figured out what it wanted. But I had to do some. <laughs> I had to I had to jump through some flaming hoops to be able to get back right with God in order to get the the help that I needed to get rid of this thing. I don't think it's gone completely, but I had like to. Yeah, I I'm going to have to. No, they can't get in the house anymore. I I, I sealed the house and I uh, had it blessed and I did some things on the property to try to ensure that it won't get in because my grandson comes to see me and he's only four years old and that's my bright, shining light right now. And if something happened to him, I, it would break me. It, it would break me, Shane. So I had to do what I had to do to get rid of it. But unfortunately, I haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't felt it. But I believe until I finally put somebody out of my life completely, that's when it's going to be gone. Because the only time negative stuff really happens is when I engage with this person. And one thing I'm going to always love is me some Roy. And I don't want to burn. I want to go up when I leave from here. So I'm going to have to shut that person down. As yeah. much as I have fought it for, for these last few years, they're just it's gotten to that point. There's just too much negativity surrounding them. And for this thing to tell me that she's mine and she was given to me and there's nothing you can do about it. At first I thought I was supposed to help her to the best of my abilities. But now that I see that wherever she goes, drama follows. And then it gets progressively worse and, you know, all they want to do is play the victim. I have to divest myself of that and just go, oh, man, I can't, I'm not no superhero. And I would never want to think about anybody having to Did we lose you, Roy? Bear with us. Sorry. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, I'm back. I think um, Big Brother is listening to us, and he might be messing with the signal. <laughs> That's what I was thinking I think, too. But, <laughs> I said that earlier. I was like, "Hey, you got yeah." Uh, <laughs> right. So I have seen a demon, and it didn't scare me as bad as that 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 preacher did. It concerned me, but it didn't scare me because. I know that God exists and <laughs> I got my faith in him. Uh, um, I never stopped believing in God, but yeah, I've, I've had some, some paranormal stuff happen and I'm still here. So <laughs> I guess um, he Brother, decided that there's question. Um, and weight mm -hmm. estimation. He said, well, I think you answered the paws and long claws, but he wanted to know how big, the estimation on the weight was on that female werewolf. When she stood up, 600 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Six, 600, 550, 600 pounds. I wow. played football for a long time, man. I, I've been in a locker room with dudes that weigh 310, 6'9", 6'7", you know, built like fire plugs or the long range ones that's this. 
I've been in a locker room with many different dudes. Even when I used to go lift weights and go to the gym, I've seen some dudes that topped out about 325. Yeah, she was – if you take Dave Batista, Ultimate Warrior, and Hulk Hogan and combine them into one, she still was bigger than all of them. Wow. And all those guys are pretty when huge. I say, yes, when I say she was jacked, if she had a flexed her bicep like that, I'm pretty sure her bicep would have been close to the size of my head. Not that I got a hermit size head, but I'm pretty sure her bicep would have been close to the size of my head, man. She was wow. jacked. I got a real good look at her. She had that knot on the back of her arm. When you you know with them dedicated weightlifters, she was. <laughs> I've never seen anything that big, man. When when she was crouched over Herman, he looked like a three year old under her. Wow. She was <laughs> that, and that's why when I hear all these other encounters about female dog men, nobody ever says they're that proportion. That's why I'm saying werewolf. There was no tufts of, of hair on the end of her ears, man. This is just, if you, when you see one, Shane, if you look it in the eyes, you're going to see the wolf, and then you're going to see, I don't know if they're part Nephilim or whatever, but you're going to see something else there, but you're going to look and see something that's like, that's an animal plus. And, bro, like I told you, when we were talking the other day and I told you it's going to be like you losing your virginity, that's how it's going to be when you, see, when, <laughs> when you see one. That's how it's going to be. And, brother, I just, I just wait for that phone call or that message to come because it's going to be one of them, too. Yep, it, it really is. <laughs> but it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change you for sure. And. I'm going to pray for you every time you say you're going out in the woods or whatever. And if you do it long enough or you hit the right area or at the right time, you're going to see it. And because of the part of the country that you're in, remember I was telling you about an empath, me being mm -hmm. an empath now, recognizing that. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said. I'm not going to tell you exactly when it happened. But you're going to see a Bigfoot and a dog man in the same day. Wow. Killed two birds with one dream. snow. I had, That's a what dream. I, <laughs> I, had, I had a dream about it. You're going to see wow. a Bigfoot and a dog man in the same day. I don't know if they're going to be together. You might run up on them and they're fighting. But that's what I've seen in my dream. But wow. I just can't tell you if it's going to happen this year, if it's going to happen next year, if it's going to happen five years from now. But when you see it, you're going to see a Bigfoot and a dog, man. Or you may be going through your pictures and see the Bigfoot and the dog, man. But it's going to happen at the same time. Wait, so you said and you had a dream brother, that you have that encounter with those two? Or that was what you just think yes, that some of you... I had a dream. Wow. I had that, a dream. That's it amazing. It was the same. When we I got off the phone the other night, I had a dream. Wow. <laughs> so... It's just because you ain't where you're at. Mm -hmm. The area that you're going into is more Bigfoot, but yeah. there are also dog men in that area. It's just that you ain't been out there long enough, or you found uh, where they either like to travel through, mm -hmm. or. And this is really weird for me to be telling you this because a year ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this stuff. But because of so many things that have happened, my, I get my messages a lot in dreams or colors. They come in colors. So I'm still trying to figure this whole thing out. If I could sell this ability, trust me, I'd sell it. But um, right. we'll talk about that more. Yeah, yeah. This, but he, what other questions do people got? Yeah, so it looks like my brother questions. Carlito over at Cryptid and Paranormal Kingdom said, uh, Shane, can you ask him how tall that werewolf was on all fours? So I'm, I'm assuming Ooh. from the grill to the top of his head. Yeah, I'm going to say she would have been, I'm 5'11", so when I was standing there looking at her, she was like this down, 
But when she came forward and I was looking at her, mm, with her arms up, I'm gonna say she was about five three. Wow! On all fours. It makes sense five, when three. she stands up. She was about nine and a half feet tall. Yeah. Wow. Because yeah, I didn't have to look down far to, to look her in her face. I mean, she was right there, and I, I got a good look at her. And with all of these years that went by, Carlito, I actually have had plenty of time to think about it and look at cows, deer, moose, rhinoceroses, <laughs> hippopotamus. You know, I've been making size comparisons all these years because it's not something that's ever going to go away. So I spent years trying to figure out, you know, well, was she about this tall? Was she about that tall? So she was about 5'3", to my best guesstimate. She was about 5'3", on all fours. Amazing. Now, wow. if she had fully extended herself up like this, she probably would have been about 5'6", but she was in a slight crouch. But I only had to slightly look down at her like that to look at her in her eyes and Dude, when you hear somebody say it looked like these things is looking you in your soul, she, <laughs> I wasn't mesmerized. I was terrified. But she looked at me like, I know you. And you ain't leaving here tonight. But I didn't feel an overpowering sense of evil. It's just that the look that she gave me was evil. Like, you're not going home. Wow. I, I don't know. I, like I said, I've never been that scared of anything in my life before that or after that. And I think the worst thing about it was to see something with a, 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 a wolf head and shoulders and arms and hands like me. That was the most terrifying thing because I'm like, man or woman, if you will, wolf, wolf, woman, no, 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 no. But in reality is, yes, that's what you're looking at, Roy. When I've seen that, I'm pretty sure something in my mind snapped to a certain degree because there are certain things that I may find funny that other people don't find so funny. And it's not that I'm cruel or cold-hearted, but if you're in a head-on collision, that's not a funny thing. But say you walk, get out of that car and walk out of there, and you only got a few scratches on you. I would laugh at that because you're alive, you only got a few scratches. But everybody else might look at me like, dude, you laughing at that? That's cold-blooded. No, I'm laughing because they just escaped death. By whatever means, they just escaped death. The other people in the car is dead. So I'm not doing it to be cruel. I'm just it's more like a that's freaking incredible laugh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it it it, it just kind of I, I kind of got a, a twisted sense of humor on some things, but something in my mind definitely snapped. It's like I know what else is out there now. I don't give a damn what you tell me. You believe I know what I've seen. So. I believe it was the door to possibility. I think the the, the dead boat got broke on that and it got kicked open. But it's actually a mental feeling rather than a physical feeling. So, yeah, she was she was a big body of work. But like I said, she was beautiful. And any other, if I had been looking at her walking across the field or behind, I don't know the walls that encase Fort Knox, where I know she can't get out and get me. I would have really stand there and look at her and get a few pictures because she was beautiful, man. I mean, her muscle tone was splendid, spectacular. The, the way she moved was like a shark on land. That's a, it, it was so smooth, that, that, that slide, man. And when she jumped, she only slightly flexed her hind legs and come down and 18, 20 feet in the pistons. Mm hmm so you got to be a bad sucker just to land in them thistles and run through them like that with them. You got needles like that on them. 
Oh yeah. And she just hauled the hindquarters through there. So I I I ain't gonna never forget that, man. Like I said, I wrote it down in my journal. Every now and again, I open it up and read about it, but I try to stay away from the hermit part because it just pulls my heartstrings so bad that it takes me a couple of days to get back right. So I kind of, I kind of, but I don't never forget that dude. And was it God that told me to stay there? What's what what I don't know, but. I didn't leave him. I did what I was supposed to do. And I just wish that sometimes, sometimes, maybe I should have went back a couple of days later just to see what was going on with him. But <laughs> I just didn't have that it factor, man, to where I'm like, okay, I'll go back at 9 a.m., you know, werewolves only going to come out at night. I don't know that to be a fact. Let me go back and just just, just see, you know. I, I did think about it, but the end result was, hell no. No, no, no. I ain't going back there. <laughs> so I didn't go. Yeah, And I'm was... not going to kick myself and punish myself because I, I'm not a hero. I'm not. But in that particular instance, I did what very few people would do. I didn't run off and leave him. So. Well, Roy, and one thing on that, though, you know, that his son said all those things about you, but you know what? That boy got another seven to eight years with his dad. Even if he wasn't in the right mental state, you still were able to get him out of there, out of danger, and give that kid eight years of his dad, even though he did die of a heart attack, you know? So you got to look at it at the glass half full. That's how I look at it, you know? You gave that kid his, his dad when he could have been taken that night, you know? So he would have never even known his dad. Right. And I agree with you. I agree with you. It's just that since he lost his dad, the streets got him because he's a gang member. And he's a bitter human being, so. <laughs> but he, I, you know, I did give him some, some time with his father, but it wasn't the kind of father like you and I had. Somebody you can go and throw a ball with, or dad, take me and teach me how to fish. You know, it was always my mom got to be there whenever I'm with my dad, or my grandmother got to be there because they wouldn't leave him unattended or unsupervised with his own son, according to what I was told. So I pray for that young man, but I just hope that we never meet face to face because I got a feeling it's going to end bad because oh, he yeah. is really convinced that we did something to his father. So I just leave it in God's hands. Maybe he'll take that trip to East Texas and cap out and come back and well, he can't reach out to me now because I changed my number, but you can find me on Facebook if you really want to. And all I want to yeah. hear is, you know what, man? I was wrong. I was wrong after what I experienced down there in East Texas. I'm like, don't worry. I told you. But he's too strong, so. Yeah. You turned that it's, page already, so. These uh, creatures are everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Casual conversation with GNA had a comment. Uh did he hear of any paranormal things happening during Katrina or after? I wasn't there for Katrina. I you came back to Nebraska in 83. Oh, 83. So what I can tell you is this. When... When you go down to the French quarters, okay, there used to be a woman down there that they, everybody called Mama. She was supposed to be the head voodoo priestess in the state of Louisiana. If you wanted a curse done, a love spell done, a leave me alone spell done, whatever you wanted, you went and seen her if you wanted to get 100% satisfaction. And I was told 
Actually, you know what? I did have something weird happen to me down there. I actually did, other than what I told you. And I was in the French quarters one night. Remember I told you I got to see the Neville brothers? Yeah. Earlier, well, I did say I got to see Ann Neville, and they performed at a bar in the French quarters, but the show started at 5 o'clock, and it was supposed to play till 9, but when it started getting dark, I left because it's time for me to go home. But because of where I had to park at, which is down by the Mississippi River on 1st Street, it was undeveloped at that time. But the farmer's market is there. So I parked back there because it would be closer than parking up on 3rd Street and walking out of the quarters that way, even though I should have parked up there. But I knew I wasn't going to be there after dark. But it was getting dark, and I was walking to my car, and the streets are cobblestone. And there's also a playhouse there where the actors actually would do period dress plays. So you might see somebody in a Civil War uniform. You might see somebody in a, a tuxedo. Um, you might see a dude in a zoot suit, you know, like a gangster. It all depends on what the play was. And I was walking to my car. I was the only one back there, and there was a guy walking on the same side of the street, probably about a block and a half away. Okay. Now, the farmer's market is closed at 5 o'clock. So it was like 7, 7 ish. And I was walking to my car, and I heard somebody walking. And I turned around and looked, and I seen this dude he had on the top hat and a cane with a cape. But he was coming from the area where the playhouse is. So I'm thinking, okay, this is just an actor out here going home, or he may be on a cigarette break or something. I don't know, but I'm paying no attention. And I kept walking. I took about 20 steps, and I could hear these footsteps behind me louder. And I turned and looked, and now this dude is only like a block away. Now he was a block and a half before, but I've taken approximately 20 steps, and now he's only a block away. And I was like, damn, he didn't sound like he was running. He was just walking. So. I kept walking, and I probably had to walk another half a block through my car. So I'm walking. I think I took another 25 steps, and I actually heard this dude a lot closer. So I turned and looked. He's about a quarter of a block away now. And I stopped, and I turned around. And I said, hey, dude, where are you going? Are you following me? He didn't say nothing. He just stood there and looked at me. I said, excuse me. I said, I really hope you don't want no problem, dude, because I got something in the trunk for you. He never said anything. I turned and I walked another few steps, and then I stopped real quick and spun around. He was gone. Wow. The only place he could have went was up the side of that building, or he just disappeared. And I stood there for maybe a minute looking. And I went to my car, I popped the truck, I got my gun out, I put it on the seat next to me, and then I went home. But I thought about that, but because I never seen where he went or that there was anything weird, I really didn't put a lot of stock into it. Yeah, where did he but go? That's the only other thing that happened to me in Louisiana, but there's, yeah, because we were in the middle of the block, so... With the farmer's market being closed, he couldn't have went in one of them stores unless he had a key. And my car and another car was the only one parked on that block. And the other car was parked further further away from mine. So I don't know where the hell he went, but he had on a cape, a top hat, and a cane with a white tip on the bottom of it. But he never put the cane on the ground when he was walking. And when I turned around and looked at him, he stood there and put his hands on top of the cane like that. And he just looked at me. And it was a, a Caucasian guy. He had a mustache. Um, he white gloves on his hands. He had on a black bow tie, a white tuxedo shirt with the, sh the short tuxedo jacket in the front with the long tails. But he had this cape on, and it only went down to about his knee. But He, it sounds like some Bram Stoker Dracula. You know, look, the way you described look, it, it just makes me think of that 92, well, 92. I, 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 if, if he was, 
Yeah, but if it was, he was out a tad bit early because the sun wasn't all the way down. And I was walking through. Well, the sun was setting, but it was still light enough that if you think about the traditional vampire, he wouldn't yeah. have been out. But I'm trying to think, was he pasty looking or something? I can't remember that. He just looked like a normal dude, but he just stood there and looked at me. That was the weirdest thing. And I'm like, hey, I don't want no trouble with you, dude. You know, what's up? And he didn't say anything. He just looked at me. But how could he cover that amount of damn distance? He was almost two blocks away when I first seen him. And in less than a, a, a half a block, now you a quarter of a block away from me? And I never heard him run. But I always heard his hard shoes on that cobblestone. So that was really weird. But I didn't get the feeling that he was a ghost or anything. It just... I don't know what it was, but I've talked to quite a few people that said they had seen something or they were taking pictures up at the cemetery and they got pictures of people in uh, Victorian dresses and uh, overcoats. And one dude said he got a picture of a, a Prussian soldier. Wow. And I said, uh, uh, what kind of soldier? He said they call Prussians. I'm like, what the hell is a Prussian soldier? So I guess maybe back in the 15th or 16th, maybe the 17th century is what he was referring to. But he said the dude had on um, a tall hat, or like a Cossack, a Cossack. He said it was okay. like that. And he showed me a picture, but it was, it was, it was blurry. But you could see what he was talking about. But this was like in the cemetery. So it, there are certain places that they say don't go to there or you might not come back like old abandoned hospitals or a mental institution or you'd have to just go to Louisiana man and talk to a few people or just stand downtown on Central Street and just close your eyes and feel and you'll be like first of all this freaking smell what is this smell and then it's like this is weird that Louisiana in itself, it just, it's got a weird feeling, man. You have to literally get yeah. used to it. Cause I know it took me about six months where I was like grocery shopping, you know, come out of the store and be like, damn, it smells like something is, is, is dead and rotten out here, but it's vegetation, not dead meat or anything. And then you just, the vibe, it's the vibe, but I never seen. Anything other than that myself, at least anything that I remember, because I was in the house a lot. So <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see a lot of stuff, but I talked to a lot of people and they would tell me Rougarou, Loop Guru, Demons. I had an interesting conversation with a lady about a vampire. She said that a vampire lived next door to her. I said, really? <laughs> she said, yeah, this woman never comes outside in the daytime. I said, Wait a minute. And I was in the library doing research on what I had seen when I had this conversation. Because she walked by me, and you know, sometimes people will look and see what you're reading. And she said, Oh, you reading books on witchcraft? And I mean, she just started cycling through my books. You reading books on witchcraft and demonology? She said, You know what? The lady that lives next door to me, she's a vampire. And I said, And I just kind of looked at her like, Okay. She said, No, I'm serious. She never comes outside in the daytime. Now, she could have been disturbed, but in her firm belief, the lady that lived next door to her never, ever came outside in the daytime. And she said she always leaves about 9 or 10 o'clock at night because she was touching me on my shoulder. Like, you know how people talk to you and they touch you on the shirt? She said she always leaves between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. She said, and she always comes home before the sun is up. And I looked at that lady and I said, can I ask you a question? She said, what? I'm like, are you retired? She said, no, I got a job. I said, you do? She said, yeah. I'm like, is your job watching your neighbor's house 24-7? She said, no. I'm like, well, how do you know what that woman doing in the daytime? She said, because I'm home. I said, and so how do you know what she does at night? She said, because I'm home. I said, are you retired? She said, no. I said, so 
Don't be offended, but it sounds to me like you're a damn busybody, and all you do is sit in your front room and with some binoculars and watch your neighbor's house. <laughs> she said, my husband passed away, and he left me enough money to survive on um, well and after I'm dead. My kids are going to have money. And she had on some nice clothes and stuff, and I said, okay, so what makes you think that this woman's a vampire? She said, because she's brought three guys home, and I've never seen them leave. Wow. So to me, you know what that means, Shane? Your ass don't never go to sleep. If you got <laughs> stuck in this woman's house day and night, when are you going to sleep? Right. So I don't know if she was telling me the truth or not, or she was just a lonely woman that wanted attention or something. But I looked at her, I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what she said, what I said. Call the police or in the daytime, go over there with a shovel and dig in her backyard and see if you can find any bodies. She said, now you're just making fun of me. <laughs> so wow. I've talked to quite a few people, man. I could talk to anybody, but if somebody walks up to you in the library and tell you, my next door neighbor is a vampire because she never leaves in the daytime. She only leaves at night. Maybe she's a stripper. <laughs> Maybe she That's works third strip on the pole. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sounds like a stripper schedule. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> right. So, but seriously, man, other than that, other than me sitting in a restaurant somewhere and basically eavesdropping on the conversation that's happening in the next booth, I haven't seen anything in Louisiana. But this was so long before Katrina, but I do have a, a paranormal encounter I could share with you that happened to me in 2000 and, oh, was that 11 or 12? 2011, my father passed away. Um, so I went to Nebraska that. to take care of him. Um, I was at work and I got a phone call from my little brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. And we were supposed to have a family uh meeting but all of my siblings are in nebraska and i'm here in arizona so i was on the phone speaker phone conversation and my father's doctor said i'm giving your father six months or less to live he's on kidney dialysis he's had a stroke um borderline diabetic um i'm i'm really not seeing <clears throat> him being around too much longer because kidney dialysis, believe it or not, I lost my oldest two brothers behind that. But my oldest brother did it for almost 26 years. His doctor says he's a medical miracle without having to get a kidney transplant. So we were having a discussion on if you're going to send my father to the nursing home or not. Absolutely not. You ain't him to no nursing home. He's in a five bedroom house. Don't none of you People got a job. Y'all can't move back in the house and take care of him. Well, we don't have time. Why not? You'll have a job. But anyway, I left my job working for the state to go take care of my father. I know what my father did for uh, his six kids from his first marriage when he was married. Sometimes he worked three jobs, man. There were times I didn't see my father during the week until Sunday when it's time to go to church. Because he'd come home, take a nap, then he'd leave, and then he, he, just, he was running himself wicked. Ragged, I'm sorry, but he didn't want my mother to work. And I think that's what caused a, a really big problem between them because she wanted to, to, to contribute. But anyway, I go to Nebraska to take care of my dad. He only got six months to live. Well, my father being the man that he is, and I'm going to always love him, he hung around for another two and a half years. I ain't got a problem with that. But after he passed away, It was just me and my dog that I have now and my girlfriend at the time. And we end up getting into an argument and she moved out. So it was me and my dog there. Well, Conan had to be four months old then. And I stayed down in the basement and he used to lay in the doorway. And I'd be watching TV, but I would notice every now and again that he would raise his head up and he would look toward the stairs 
And then he turned his head like this, like he's watching somebody walk across the basement into the bathroom. And a couple of minutes later, I see him raise his head up and look back again. And like somebody came out the bathroom and went back over to the stairs and go upstairs. And I just watch him. I'm like, was there somebody there, dude? And he just wagged his tail. But I was at home one night, one morning at my father's house, and I heard somebody walking around upstairs. So I got up and went up there. There's nobody up there, but I could clearly hear somebody up there walking around. Um, I walked into a couple of cold spots down in the basement. I mean, cold spots. So I grew up in that house for a short time, and everybody on the block was still there from when I was a child. But I was taking the trash out one day, and the neighbor up the street called to me because I have a brother that's older than me, but we're basically twins, believe it or not. But this, we're six years apart. Oh, wow. And she thought I was him and she was calling to me. And I said, I'm not him. I said, I'm Roy. I'm not that. I'm not the other one. And she, you know, she walked down to the end of the yard. She said, you know what you do? And your brother looks so much alike. I thought she was him. I'm like, I know. That's why I cut all my hair off because I ain't trying to look like him. I want you to be able to tell the difference. But she's like, well, how are you doing? You know, I ain't seen you in years. I'm like, well, I came up here to take care of my father. She's like, she said, oh, that was so good. She said, yeah, I seen when they sent the the the, the uh the funeral uh car to come and get him. I'm like, yeah, he's gone. She's like, well, how's everything in that house? I said, what you mean? She's like, how's everything in that house? I said, it's living in a house. What do you mean? She said. You ain't you ain't seen nothing weird. And I looked at her, I said, Miss Allen, what are you talking about? She said, Ain't nobody told you about your daddy's house. I said, No, ma'am. What is about my father's house? She said, You know five people died in that house since you've been gone, then. I said, Excuse me? She said, Yeah, five people died in that house. Now the first lady died in the house died while her and my father was having sex. She had a heart attack. I said, damn, dad was putting it down like that. But I was just joking with her. And I'm like, she had a heart attack? I'm like, damn, dad. You know? So the, the second lady died. <laughs> the second lady died. And I'm serious about this. And I'm not joking. The second no. lady died I totally believe you, in the bathroom on the toilet. Wow. And I'm like, what? I'm like, so what? Did she have a heart attack or something? I think she had a brain aneurysm and she fell off the toilet and hit her head on the side of the tub and passed away. Wow. The third lady died in bed with my father in her sleep. I'm like, okay, this is starting to disturb me now. Yeah. I'm like, they all passed away upstairs? She said, yeah, three of them did. Now, the last two died down in the basement. There was a lady that my father had met, and she was down on her luck, so he told her she could come and stay. He had a spare bedroom down in the basement. Just give me what you can every month until you get on your feet, is what my father told her. That's the kind of man my father was. Well, he didn't realize that this lady was a heroin addict, and she OD'd in the room right next to where I was standing in the basement. So the fifth person that died was this right here, man, is, is my father married, got remarried after him and my mother got divorced some years later. Mm -hmm. And the woman that he married, her and her husband, he was, he was an alcoholic, okay? And she would drink too, but they frittered their money off to the extent that they were basically homeless. And my father, this is when I knew what kind of heart my dad hit, had. He told her, you and your husband can come and stay here. Y'all got six months to get your act together. I'm going to give y'all room and y'all can stay there. I don't know a lot of men that would let their ex-wife move into their house 
with their new husband and let him stay there. And he put him in the room right next to his. But it was wow. down in the basement. Mm -hmm. They got to fighting one night. A gun was grabbed. And when the smoke cleared, this woman had shot her husband in the head and the bullet went through his head and came out the wall in my father's room about seven inches above his head where he was laying in the bed. Wow. So, when my father was dying, he asked me when I was feeding him one day, he kept looking past me like this. Okay. And his room, he got the closet with the sliding doors. And he kept looking past me like that. And I'm like, Dad, what are you looking at? He said, I'm looking at that dude standing over there staring me while I'm eating. Whoa. Now, I'm sitting in his wheelchair feeding him because he's paralyzed on one side. So I turn around and look, and there's nobody there. And I'm like, Dad, you got me. That was a good one. He's like, you don't see that dude standing in the closet looking at me? So I got up and went to the closet. And where he said the dude was at, the guy would have had to be standing in the middle of the clothes. That was hanging on the, the, the uh, closet rack, and his head was just above the um, the rack itself. And he said there was a dude in there with a black hoodie on, blue jeans, and blue and white tennis shoes. But where his face should be, it was just black. And I'm sticking my hand there, and of course I'm like, Dad, you seeing him? He said you putting your hand right through his face, son. I can't believe you can't feel it. Now it did feel cold in that closet. Wow. But I didn't see anybody. So. I was feeding him, and about three minutes later, he turned and looked out the back window because his house was his room was in the back of the house, and he said, "There you go, right there." Walked across the backyard, and I'm looking. I don't see anybody. He said, "You mean to tell me you don't see that dude in that black hoodie and the blue jeans walking across the backyard? He just walked through the fence." I'm like, "Wait a minute. You mean he climbed over the fence?" He said, "He just walked through the fence. He's walking through the neighbor's yard." My father was pretty close to. To where he got to the point where he told me he didn't want to go to dialysis any, anymore or anything like that. He said he was tired of being here. But he started seeing this same dude three, three or four more times. And then my nephew had come to visit me and his girlfriend. Her son went in the bathroom one day. And because my father was in a wheelchair, they went to take the bathroom door off so they could get him in back and forth from the tub. But when they put it back on, they didn't line it up properly, so the door wouldn't close flush. You had to push at the top of it to close it. And this boy went in the bathroom and closed the door, my girlfriend's son. He was in there maybe two minutes, and he started yanking and pulling on the door, and he was screaming. So me and my nephew jump up and run back there, and we busted up the door, and I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you? He ran by us, and his pants, you know, he was holding his pants up, this boy done peed everywhere in the bathroom but in the toilet. And he ran in there and jumped on the couch and was hugged up to his mother. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I asked him, what's the matter with you, dude? What did you see? He said, this dude stuck his head out the closet and looked at me. Now, there's a linen closet in the bathroom with three shelves. There's no way an adult can stand up in that closet and look at you. You can get down on the floor and go up under the bottom shelf and fit up under there. But you can't stand up anywhere in that closet. There's just not enough room. So he said this dude stuck his head out of the door and looked at him while he was using the bathroom. And it scared him so bad, he just started urinating all over the bathroom. And I made him go in there and clean up all of it, too. Your mess, you clean it up. Wow. The next day, his sister went into the front bedroom where my father used to sleep at. And she said when she opened the door and walked in, I know she was only up there maybe two seconds, and she screamed, she squeaked rather, and come hauling high in back down the hallway and slid by the entryway to the dining room, the living room, and she ran and jumped on the couch, and I'm like, okay, what's the matter with you? Now she said, there's a dude standing in the bedroom looking out the window watching my brother's play, and I'm like, what he got on? She said he got on a black hoodie, some blue jeans, and some blue and white tennis shoes. Oh, they left the next day, and now I'm in the house by myself. So I went downstairs because that's where I stayed at, and I came upstairs one night about two thirty 
in the morning to get something to drink and go to the bathroom because there's a bathroom upstairs. And you know what it feels like when somebody's right here in your personal space looking at you. They're they not menacing you. They're just standing real close to you, like right here in your space. And I came out of the bathroom and I was standing in the kitchen drinking some water and I felt that right here and I just simply said this. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are. As long as you leave me and my dog alone, you can stay here. As soon as you bother one of us, I got something for you. I got something for you. And immediately, I felt that presence ease away. Now, me and my girlfriend made up, and she came back. She was upstairs taking a bath. And I heard her talking, but I don't know what she was saying. So I called her on the phone. I'm like, are you on the phone? She's like, no. I said, who are you talking to? She said, Roy, I'm not talking. I'm taking a bath, and I'm listening to music. I said, okay, maybe I'm hearing the music playing. She said, no. You said you heard somebody talking. I come upstairs, and there's a T intersection. When you come out of the kitchen, you can go this way, or you can come out of the dining room and go this way. But there's a T section with a long hallway like that, and you got a bedroom here, a bedroom here. So there's three bedrooms upstairs and right there. So the back bedroom is where my father was when he passed away. So when I got upstairs, I could hear somebody talking in the back bedroom. And I went back there and stood in a doorway and I heard two people talking. I didn't see two people, but I heard two people talking. I couldn't wait to move out of that house, Shane. <laughs> I couldn't wait to move out of that house after that because what they were saying is when he go to sleep when he goes to sleep tonight, that's when we're gonna get him. But we gotta make sure that he's all the way asleep. Well, we're going to get him tonight when he go to sleep. Really? I don't think so. I do You're not think so. so. I'm really curious to go back up there and talk to the people that live in that house now, man. Because when I heard that and I told my girl, she's like, Roy, why are you playing? I'm like, when you know me to play like that? I said, go back there and stand in that doorway. Now, when she stood back there, she said she heard somebody whispering, but she couldn't make out what they were saying. But when I heard him say, when he go to sleep tonight, that's when we going to get him. We didn't stay in that house that night. We went got a hotel room, and we moved out the next day. <laughs> uh, you did Absolutely the right thing. Not. So I've, wow. I've done some, yeah, I mean, I've seen some stuff in Nebraska that will make you wonder. I wish I could call my cousin so he could verify this, but there's a lake called Carter Lake in Nebraska. But it's in Iowa, believe it or not. There's a little section of Iowa that they refuse to sell that's on the Nebraska side of the Missouri River. A lot of people got killed around that lake or in that area over the years because it's an old lake. I think it was established in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Well, me and my two cousins used to go down there late at night and smoke weed. And we, we'd be drinking a little bit too. So we went down there one night. It was the kind of night where it's March and it snowed, but the snow hasn't um, melted. There's still patches of snow on the ground, and it hasn't got cold enough to where it's not. Um, oh, um, when when you got a condensation coming up off this pile of snow, where mm -hmm. it's causing it to be foggy all around because it was really humid. It was unseasonably warm in March with the, with the snow on the ground. So we were sitting in the car and my cousin in the back kept wiping the window with a rag because we were sitting in there smoking and we wanted to see if the cops was going to roll up on us so we could get rid of some stuff and probably get ready to get out of Dodge. Well, my cousin in the back was kind of nearsighted, okay? And because of how it was foggy, but there were patches that were clear and then you see other fog, he was sitting in the back and... He said, no, actually, he did see it. My cousin C was driving, and he looked. He got out to go to the bathroom, and he came back. He's like, hey. He said, cuz. I'm like, what? He's like, look. And I'm looking like, what exactly am I looking at, dude? He said, he said, look at that smoke right there. 
So we got a slight breeze that's blowing from the north to east, southeast direction. And the fog would billow that way, but this particular patch of smoke he wanted me to look at, it was coming in a serpentine pad pattern, but it was coming toward us. It just was taking a long swooping path like that. And I'm looking and I'm like, that's really weird. So we standing there looking and I ain't gonna never forget this because his father had got him a 67 Pontiac GTO. It needed some work done to it, but it was his car. So we're looking at this and as it got closer, my cousin in the back said, what the F is that, man? What is that? So we looking and it, it got about maybe 50 feet away, you could see it was a woman in a white dress with an umbrella and her hair was up on top of her head, but from her shin down to the ground, there was nothing there. You could clearly see her though. And my cousin said, oh, hell no, we out of here. So he get in the car to go to start it. But remember I said it needed some work. So sometimes it won't start and you got to actually get the tire iron out the trunk and bang on the starter to make the car start. <laughs> so he had to lay down in this half frozen puddle of water and he's banging the starter, talking about, man, start to start to see if it is trying, see if it's trying. Nin, 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 nin. He's banging, bang, 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 try. So by the time we peeled out of there, this figure was about 20 feet away from but you could see it. It was a woman in um uh, not Victorian dress, but a little house on a prairie style dress. But she had an umbrella, a parasol, and her hair was up on her head. And you could make out her features, not crystal clear, but she looked like she was made of smoke. Two other people was with me when we seen this. And if we talking tomorrow, I can call him and you can talk to him. He'll verify what I told you because he drove over the um, parking bricks and stuff in the parking lot trying to get to the road. And we left and we didn't go back down there anymore. <laughs> but other than that, no more personal paranormal experiences that I can think of, but my father's house was, um, it was one of the most haunted places I have been in because so many people had sightings in there and then I had that feeling. But when I heard them voices, dude, it was time for me to go. So that's the only paranormal stuff that I experienced in my lifetime. Um, and I hope other than this crap with my car, so I'm really hoping that I don't ever have to deal with anything else because that in itself is, imagine your car horn going off between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock at least three times a week, and the only way you can get it to stop is to disconnect the battery. Yeah. <laughs> I took it to three different mechanic shops, and they told me, dude, you ain't got no electrical issues. We can't find nothing wrong. I'm like, dude, so you mean to tell me my car horn is just spontaneously going out like that? And dang, I wish I could. I'll, I wish I could send you the pictures of the car, but I'd have to log off because they're actually in this phone I'm talking to you on. But I'll send them to you, and if you want to share them um, yeah, in yeah, the group, definitely. you can. But okay, when they yeah, see yeah, what, what my car looks like with, when I took the pictures, you're going to be like, wait a minute, dude. What the hell is that? So any doubts that I had about something freaking messing with my car, they got put to rest when I seen that thing. Oh, I think I showed them to the, uh, David from Texas. I believe I did. If not, I'll send them to him too. But <clears throat> I had to do a blessing. There's a Bible in my car now. I got a couple of uh, crystals in there and a cross that I had blessed. And now... Finally, nothing messes with my car, but I actually had to reach out to somebody to get some advice, and they helped me more than they know. Um, I thought she would be in the chat section because she's usually up this time of night, but she's in another country. But if she's in there, she'll uh, comment where she might just watch it later. But she helped me a great deal with this, man, because I was lost. I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And then when she told me, she said, she asked me seven questions, and I answered them, and she said, demon but uh, this thing came and talked to me in my dream and then I seen it in the house and it told me 
it wasn't here for me. I'm in the way of it getting somebody else. And we talked about that person earlier. Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. I'll send you a drawing that I I'll send you the drawing that I had done. Yeah, if you could, that'd be awesome, brother. Hey, I, um, I had a and, quick and question. I share my encounter. Yeah. Um That's my buddy, true. my buddy cryptid five five okay. nine out here in California, he had a question going back to your werewolf uh, encounter. Uh, he said, did you feel or sense there were other ones around you guys? Or was it just the one werewolf, no. would you say? No. Um, even even the lights I've seen, even the lights I've seen, those were lights. Those were not the eyes of another animal. Now I asked my, I did tell my father about this, sure, uh, about about half, maybe eight months before he passed, and he told me that the military had goggles, night vision goggles that looked just like that, because he he used to be in the military. I'm like, Dad, please tell me you plan. He's like, No, son. I didn't think he would believe me, and he said, While I don't know what you seen, I know you seen something, because I know you. You're my son. You're my youngest son. But no, I did not get the feeling that there were others around and they could have been it, because of how dark it was in those thistles. If there were no thistles, man, I would have never known. But I'm, I'm of a mind that she was there by herself. It's just that something went wrong with what her intentions were. Now, I got a strange phone call last year on Messenger. It came up all zeros. And I talked about this on um, David and Lee's podcast. I got a phone call from a dude with a heavy European accent. And he told me that he listened to my counter all four times and that I never changed anything. So he knew I wasn't uh, making it up. And I said, Okay, but who are you and how are you able to call me where your name is not showing up and I'm seeing all the zeros? He's like, that's because I don't want anybody to know about this conversation. I can't even find that number in my messenger, dude. It's like it never happened. And I talked to him twice for a total of seven. I wrote it down seven hours and 17 minutes. I talked to him, not at once, but over two conversations. And he told me wow. the reason he contacted me is because he knew I needed an answer on what it was I seen. Now, all I can do is tell you what he said. I have no proof of this. And I wish I had to took a screenshot or something to prove that I, this guy did call me. But all it's going to show is zero, no name, no profile pic, none of that stuff. And he said, I'm a fourth generation werewolf hunter. This is what I do for a living. I said, what? okay, so what you calling me for? He said, I listened to your encounter all four times you shared it. He said, I know you're not lying. And I know you got questions. He said, but what you saw that night was a werewolf. It wasn't a dog, man. It wasn't a hybrid. It was a werewolf. I said, you can prove that? He said, not in any way that would make you believe me. But if you just listen to what I'm going to tell you, and like I said, he's got a heavy accent. He said his name was Boris, but I don't think that was his real name. He said, that creature's intentions that night well, one of two things. She was either going to kill you and eat you, or she was going to change you. I said, you know, because I can be a smarty pants sometimes. I'm like, I'm a grown ass man. I don't need no diaper change. What you mean, change me? You're going to have to explain what you're saying, dude. He said, she was going to turn you, Roy. I said, for what? I didn't never do nothing to her. He said, Think about your physical stature at the time. You're in your prime 
you already can run faster than the average man because you worked on your body to get that speed. You're strong and you're reasonably smart. I've listened to you talk. You would have been an asset. I'm like, to what? He's like, either she had left her pack. Yeah, werewolves have packs too, according to him. And she was going to change you to make you her alpha so y'all could start another pack. I said, man, come on, dude. Uh, every werewolf I done seen on TV, that's not how he's like. He said, forget that bullshit that you see on TV. That's BS. He said, 10% of that stuff is true. The rest is BS. I said, so you're telling me, you're confirming for me that a person can change from a human being into a werewolf. He said, yes, but it has to be a certain type of person. He said, there are three types of werewolves. You have pure bloods, you have um, half bloods, and then you have what they call mutts. I said, really? I said, are you being serious with me? I mean, I questioned him, Shane. I really did because I thought it was somebody messing with me. And he said, a purebred is somebody that was born a werewolf. Both of their parents are werewolves. Each different level has three different skill sets, if you will. Some of them can be telepathic. Some of them can actually use telekinesis. And the third one is uh, the power to allure you, meaning they can captivate you in a human form to make you pretty much be a slave to them. But these are only the pure bloods that can do it. He said a half breed is one of the parents is a werewolf that breeds with a regular human being, but they are going to change. They're always going to change, but they're tied into the moon cycles. Oh, he said okay. mutts are people that were attacked by werewolves with the intent to be killed and eaten, but they get away. And nobody teaches them how to be a werewolf, so they just run amok when they change. But only the purebreds can change at will. They don't need the moon, and it doesn't have to be nighttime, and it doesn't have to be daytime. Now, this is what this dude told me, saying, I have no reason to make this up. Wow. And I talked to him two separate occasions. He told me there's two three-letter agencies here that they contact when they have to come to the United States What a coincidence. Of course, <laughs> of course, they're going to, you're going to lose your Roy right when you uh, start talking werewolf killers. <laughs> wow. Sorry, guys, for the technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully, we can get them back. Cryptid559, hopefully, that answered some of your questions, brother, or I don't know if we're going to get them back. Okay, awesome. David from Texas. Uh, Roy, have you gone back down there to that area where the encounter happened? I think he was telling me on our phone call on Sunday he hasn't. David, if you're still listening, I think he, uh, after Nebraska, he moved back to Arizona, I think. So but I, I can ask him this question just to reconfirm it. But government put Roy on pause it looks like he's telling too much evidence I'm expecting a black SUV outside uh, my house tomorrow morning let's see here I think we got him back let's see okay <laughs> what okay. a coincidence so, um, I I don't know why this guy contacted me other than for him to tell me what he told me. But mm -hmm. according to him, that was her intention. She was either going to eat me or she was going to change me. And that gave me a few bad nights. It gave me a few bad nights because I'm like, first of all, 
out of all the people in the world that have seen these encounters or done stuff, there's people in Romania, Transylvania, England, Switzerland, Germany, Russia, Siberia. You could have talked to them about it. Why are you talking to me? And he said, because I know you're not lying. He said, there are some people out there that do it. Now, I will understand that there are some people that are going to be like, you know what, he lying his ass off right now. I'm okay with that. I'm just telling people what this guy told me. If he wanted to call me up and tell me this stuff and act like a kook, okay, I'm okay with that. But if he didn't, and he was telling the truth, I either dodged the bullet I'm extremely unlucky because I don't think I'd have a problem with living to be 120 and never looking older than 18 or 19. I don't think I'd have a problem being able to run 45, 50 miles an hour in a human form. I don't think I'd have a problem with that. But does that mean now? We lose you again, Roy. Marion said, Yay, Roy is okay. He was. Then he went on pause again. Damn government. <laughs> See if we can get him back. Let me remove this one real quick. Okay, there he is. All right, we got you, brother. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, but this is why I was telling you a few months ago you needed to talk to me because I wanted you to feel me out so you could see if I was a kook or not. Oh, <laughs> but, I never once ever thought you were. After I heard you on David and Lee's encounter, brother, I was like, I want to talk to this guy, you know, and I know I've been busy with everyday life and, you know, but I'm glad, you know, you were able to come on to the show and you know, tell us about it. And I've wanted to hear it, you know, in person, you know, and I've watched your episode on Bix a couple times, you know, and listen to Roy and, uh, or listen to you on, uh, David and Lee's, you know, and incredible, you know, and love your stories, man. Yeah. Um, I know it's getting late I, right now, for you, Roy. Um, uh, and for myself, I got to yeah. get up early, uh, work tomorrow. Um, I don't think we, I think we answered all the questions. Let me double check. Oh, uh, David from Texas. Um, Roy, have you gone back down to that area where the encounter happened? I think I told him you said no, you haven't, right? Absolutely. Hey, nephew. Um, <laughs> absolutely not. I have not been back to that area, but believe it or not, I did do some satellite research, looking on Google Maps and actually looking at the area through the satellite. You're not going to believe what they did with that area. All the railroad tracks are gone. The neighborhood is gone. The New Orleans Saints practice facility now sits in that area. I did further research. They had a reclamation act, Union Pacific Railroad did in 96, to where they removed the majority of the railroad tracks that run through Metairie, Louisiana. The building is gone. The neighborhoods are gone. There's a huge park there and a cemetery in the back. I don't recall that cemetery being there before. But they changed the whole area, man. And that really made me think. Now, the reason they said they pulled the tracks up was the residents of Metairie started complaining about extra, extraordinarily long wait times for trains to pass that were causing people to be late for work or to get home from work. And they um, 
what is it called when they um they get a certain amount of signatures together in order for it to bring it to the city council so that the city council will hear i can't think of what that paper is but they got enough signatures <clears throat> and they finally got that passed to where they removed the tracks and they bought them people out of the neighborhood the new orleans saints did so they could put the practice facility in and it's huge it's got three football fields this huge building plus the parking lot but you can see on the ground exactly where the railroad tracks used to run and i did this last year but as far as going back to that area if i would ever go back even today or next week or next year send me with 44 special marines and let me sit in a tank and i'll go back to that area because if you look at it from the satellite, the Mississippi River isn't that far away, and there are woods everywhere, or it used to be in that area. The whole drive, but they even changed the name of Airline Highway to Airline Road. It's just, they changed so much, but when you're driving up Airline Highway or Airline Road now, if you look to the left and the right from the highway, there's thick woods on both sides of the road, not come up right up to the road, of course. They're probably cut back about 50, 60 feet, but it's thick back there. Trees with Spanish moss hanging on them. If you drive through there at the right time, you'd be like, ooh, this is eerie. And yet, when I had to drive home, I'm driving down that black highway and I'm flying. It's only a few cars coming and going, but I'm flying. I'm surprised the cops can see that that whole area is shiny, but no, David, I did not go back, brother. And <clears throat> I can't think of a number with enough zeros behind it that will make me go back there today because I can't put a price. Yeah, I don't blame you. I, I don't think if it tra something like that traumatized me, you know, what you went through, Roy, you, you couldn't pay me a million dollars or a billion dollars, you know, you see what happened to Herman, you know, I, some things are just better, you know, like you said, you told me earlier, better to, you've already had your encounter and you don't would never want to do it, you know, did we lose you, brother? So, yeah, I mean. I don't blame the guy for not wanting to go back. If it scared him that bad. We'll try Roy one more time before we get off just so we can say goodbye. Or uh there we go. Okay. There he is. There so, we go. Um I know you said it's about time to wrap it up and um, I understand. I just have one thing I'd like to add, unless you yeah, have any go more ahead. questions. Yours. Since I have entered into the crypto world, shortly after I shared my encounter with Vic, I have met some amazing people. Amazing. Some of them, we're going to be friends for life. Some of the people I've met aren't worth the paper that they're printed on. And at one time I felt sorry for him, but God gave us free will. So you do what you're going to do with your life, with whatever you decide to do in life. And I don't wish anybody bad. I hope everybody finds the success that they, that they, they crave. I honestly do. But for me, this will be the last time that I share my encounter on anyone's podcast. I just, I can't deal with the negative energy that exists in the cryptic world. And that is not to say anything negative or derogatory about you saying you are nothing but a top notch guy. If you need me to help you in any way, all you gotta do is let me know. If you don't have to ask, just let me know. I and I'll really be there appreciate for that, you. Brother. I really do. But for me, I have to go. 
for my spiritual energy, my men, my mental energy. I cannot survive in this pool anymore. It's just, I'm interested in cryptids, but it was never anything that I loved. It was just an interest. And that's been taken away from me because of all the drama that I've had to deal with. But anybody that's talked to me will find out I'm just a normal, everyday, average guy. I get mad like other people get mad. I cry like other people cry. I laugh like other people laugh. But this, at my age now, I'm on my journey to find something that truly makes me happy. And that's a wife. So I'm going to spend my time fishing, loving my grandson, and searching for a wife. And if things get too tough and looking for a wife, I got me a good sized piece of wood over there that I could go straight ug and pop her on the back of the head and drag her back to the cave and you're gonna be my wife. But <laughs> <laughs> other than that, that you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> so get caught. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, she can't scream, she knocked out, so I think I'll be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be in the cage. Right. But, <laughs> I just I need to do stuff now on a level that makes my soul happy once again. And in 2018 was the last time that I was truly happy with everything that I considered life. And every now and again. I may reach out to somebody behind the scenes and talk about it, but the only thing that would bring me back is something extraordinary happen, or if there's a five-figure payday in it, and then I'll come back because I want money just like everybody else, but other than that, I'm bowing out, and I wish everybody well, and I hope that beef gets squashed, and People learn to be people again instead of messiahs or zealots and hanger on and just because he said, she said, just let that go and act like a damn adult. If all of these so-called researchers, I'm not going to say experts because nobody's an expert, but know-it-alls would pool all their knowledge together, we probably could get at least 50% of the answers that we need concerning these cryptids and the mystery that surrounds them. But this is this is Roy Stubblefield's last time because I don't enjoy it like I used to. And I know that if I had put more of my heart and soul into it, I probably could become a big name. But I really only got into this because I was hoping that one of them guys that I was with would hear my encounter and reach out to me and tell me what the rest of their life was like or what happened that night after I left. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Well, Roy, it was an honor for you to hear your encounter one last time, brother, in, in person and on our platform. You know, it, like I say, it's a truly an honor and I couldn't think of someone better to start with my very first encounter, you know, and I thank you. And I th thank you for having me, Shane. Uh, yeah, I think we don't have any other comments. Uh, oh, we do have one more um, casual conversation with a uh, with G and A. What is his channel on YouTube? What's your YouTube channel, brother? Roy Stubblefield. No, oh, okay. So just your name. Roy you and yeah, okay. yeah, that's my name. And I'll take you to my page. And the video that he wants to watch is a minute and 56 seconds long. Okay. Perfect. I'll actually check that out myself. I didn't know you had a YouTube page. <laughs> yeah, well, I started it and I just wanted to share that video that I took because Dude, it's weird. It's really weird to go outside. And if you listen to the way my car horn sounds, it don't even sound like a car horn. 
it sounds like a train horn. And um, I'll share that with you behind the scenes about yeah, everything yeah. that that involves because it's creepy. It's creepy. And it really rattled me to my core when I found out what all of that meant because now I got to deal with a demon that's not of my making, that I had no truck with, didn't make any bargain with. And dude, <laughs> when you fighting for your soul, that's when you really and seriously get tested. You are tested. And you find out if your faith in God is strong enough to pull you through or if you're going to have to have help. And I wasn't strong enough in my faith in God at the time. But it reawakened my faith in him. Not that I ever turned away from him. It's just that I wasn't acknowledging him and every, all of his creations as I should have been. But I do daily now, at least twice a day. I have picked up the Bible again, and I'm learning more about the Bible every day. So when I tell you exactly what happened, you're going <laughs> to... You're going to just be like, wow, and wow, and super freaking wow, Roy. So I need to get right on other levels also. So I'm going to focus on doing that stuff. But like I said, if you ever need me for anything, man, just let me know what you need. And I got oh, you yeah. fixed. No, I appreciate it, brother. And like I said, I'm, just because this is your last interview doesn't mean I still won't stop talking to you. I think we've been talking every single day, you know, to say, hey, good morning or hey, brother, I hope you have a good day kind of thing. So I appreciate it, brother. And uh, yeah, I know you got to get going and I got to uh, get out an early morning myself. So, but brother, I appreciate you coming on to, the, to our platform and telling us your encounter. And we hope you have a good evening. Okay. Okay, thank you, Shane. Like I said again, thanks for having me. And um, if anybody has any further questions, you can um, find me on Facebook or Messenger and um, just shoot it to me there and I'll do the best that I can to answer whatever you have. But um, Oh, did we lose you? I'm gonna try him one last time so he can finish what he was saying. Besides losing signal. Until he can get back on. I just wanna wish everyone that came on to the show tonight just to listen. Uh, thank you all for coming on and listening. I appreciate it more than you know. Just a dog man researcher that wants to keep, you know, doing interviews while researching, you know, get the awareness out of these creatures and werewolves, Sasquatch, uh, any other type of cryptid out there. So try another, give him another minute, but if he doesn't come on, I'm going to try to do this interviews once or twice a month on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Um, oh, looks like we got them. Here we go. Okay. And we got you so, back, brother. I didn't want your signal to right. be your last words, so you get the last words in. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, I don't know what's going on with this thing tonight, man. I, I honestly don't, but um, yeah, um, anybody got any questions, you can find me on Facebook or um um, oh, you can post it on if you watch the video, you can post it on there, and that's pretty much. I mean, I got some other stuff that p other people have talked to me about, but I really don't have any personal encounters of my own that I can relay. But, um, I just want everybody to have a great night, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember God first and everything else next, and you should be okay. Awesome. 
Well, brother, you have a good night. And like I say, a million times over, thank you so much and have yourself a good night. All right, man. You have a good night. Good night, everybody. Night, everybody. We'll see thank you, you down the road a piece, I guess. Yep. See you guys later. <laughs> All right. Let me see. Okay, go down here to leave.